And every now and again, like we work, we work hard, don't we? We talk about length at breadth at country. Every now and again, you've got to get a little bit of downtime. So we come to my local golf club. The business meeting. That's what it is. Here we go. That one. That one. <laughs> Mark O'Brien this week and book, buckle yourself in for this one. It is uh, some story, by the way. Outrageous talking on your backswing. That's an uh, it's an unbelievable episode. Ex Derby, Motherwell, Luton. Newport and the story behind it is incredible isn't it? An unbelievable story from start to finish. Jack Matty, this is how they do it on the telly lads. Oh you bastard. <laughs> it's some story this man. You've got the book coming out soon haven't you? Yeah there's a book coming out I'm hopefully gonna be releasing it in September now which would be a good one that it's literally just like what everybody told me, like your life being a story, they literally said like, um, just get it out there. And somebody approached me to go for the book, and I just thought, well, I might as well go for it because it is, it's, it's crazy what's happened. Like, if you go back, you started at Derby. You were in the first team at sixteen. Yeah, I flew over when I was fifteen, um, that summer, and then done a season. Well, up until around November when I turned sixteen, um, and then they were able to register me as a as a Derby player. So I went from the 16s and then I was playing with the under 18s. And then it was around the time, I'd say Christmas time or so on, they were playing against the Glen Hoddle Academy with the with the reserves. And a second year scholar got injured. So Clough, the manager, turned around and said, look, we want him from the under 18s up to play with us. So I went on and I literally had five minutes just to come onto the pitch and see what it was all about and just threw myself in front of one block and stuff. And the manager kind of liked what he saw. Then steadily like built it up again, got another about 20 minutes in a reserve game. Then more minutes after that. And then, as I said, I got to the last week of the season and Nigel Clough just turned around and said, look, do you fancy uh, coming to Watford last day of the season? What did you think you were going for to Watford? Do you think you're playing or do you think you're just thinking he's taking you up bus to make the teas and coffees and all that? Yeah. But that's what we always all we I all literally done. thought it was going to be something like that. I thought it was just for the experience because it was the last game of the season for the academy. And obviously, me, uh, ma and dad were over for it. So Noisy Clough was talking to my parents up on the top of the hill down in Moor Farm in the training ground. And my dad came out with me and goes, I'll see you next week. And I was like, what do you mean you'll see me next week? Like, I'm home next week because the academy's finished. He goes, no. He said, uh, as my dad calls, he goes, I was speaking to me mate Noisy up on the hill. <laughs> and I just started laughing. And he goes, I was speaking to me mate Noisy up on the hill. He said, well, coming over next week. I said, no, you're not. He goes, yeah. He said, look, you're going with the first team. So I thought it was my dad just being the way he was. And then on the Monday, Gary Crosby, who was the uh, the coach, came up to the academy changing room and just literally knocked on the door. I'll be with us this week. So like you say, I just went like white as a ghost and like you start shaking everything going down to the force team training. And like, as you say, there's like Robbie Savage, there was Connolly, Steve Davis, everyone like that. And I was always the kind of kid that off the field never spoke to anybody wouldn't open my mouth like as a youngster in football like never spoke to nobody but when I was on the park it was just like right I'd kick anybody I'd throw myself in front of things and that's what obviously they loved the most out of everything and went down for the first day of training and all the lads like loved it I like enjoyed it trained well and uh, like in the canteen afterwards and all like that the first team lads coming over saying you were you were man of the match today you were brilliant and you feel like a million dollars because I was sitting with all the scholars and you have all the first team lads coming over and saying how well I done so like I said I had all week with the first team so I just thought travel to Watford it's going to be just the experience of being there and then when we got there um, I was on the bench and again, I was just sitting there thinking, and I was like, well, you know what? On the bench, this is great. Look, at it was 20,000 fans, and it was the most I've ever played in front of in my life. And then uh, they were 3-0 down in the first half. And as 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 it went, like, Lewin Noyatanga was having an absolute stinker. He had a few of them, half. didn't he, to be fair, <laughs> <Louis. Yeah. laughs> He did have a few of them, but him. But yeah, he was having an absolute stinker. And halftime came, so then we go back out, and I'm sitting behind the... 
assist in Andy Garner. And one of the other lads on the bench like looked over the shoulder and goes, you're coming on after 60. I thought, no chance. So then I looked up at the board and there was 58 minutes gone and Andy Garner just goes, oh, be get warm. And then Nigel Clough, to be fair, it's someone like just pulled me in and just said to me, he was like, look, go on there, kick it, head it, be a defender. He said, that's all I wanted to do. He said, don't think of anything else. He said, just do what you've been doing. So I talked grand. So Lewin Noyatanga got taken off and I played centre-half with Rob Hulse. So I'm going in at centre-half with Rob Hulse, who obviously is a striker. Yeah. And he turned around to me and Rob Hulse, the first word he said to me, goes, you're the centre-half here, you tell me what to do. <laughs> so I'm thinking, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so like I said, again, like I went out and start winning me headers and cleared one off the line as well. And like I said, I just had like a great half an hour and we scored a goal when I was on the pitch. So that was another little thing. And again, like everything that i done well, like all the senior lads who would like are known for banter, like Robbie Savage and people like that. He straight away was over arm around the shoulder. After the game, he's like bringing me over where my family are in the stand, making me like wave to the fans. And like, he was just brilliant with me. And like, it made you feel on top of the world after the whole thing. So like I said, yeah, at 16, it was, um, it was crazy to kind of say it, but it felt like everything was just like on a snowball, but just getting better and better that season. Like there was just nothing that was stopping me. See, there can't be many 16 year old centre halves that have come on in a... Uh, well, I think Lewin got in early, didn't he? Le um, Lewin might have played at 16, 17 at, at Darwin. Oh, did he? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. Like I, I at the time, I think someone just goes like, I, I think you like at the time I was like the second or third youngest ever to play at Derby. But other than that, then, like, I just, I'd never seen anything like that. I was just thinking, right, I've got asked to play and I'll just go play. Like, that's the, the mentality I had coming over. I'm not even envisioning your, your kit fitting you at 16. Oh, no, I've looked <laughs> back at pictures, like, the kit is hanging on me. <laughs> like, I mean, it's the baggiest kit I've ever worn. So the end of that season, you got into the summer. It couldn't have gone any better, could it, that first year? Were you just thinking, get back pre-season? And hopefully be as many involved in as many games as you can. Yeah, like that that was that was literally it. Like obviously all my family like, oh that's amazing what you've done, like brilliant. Look at things now it's just to kick on. I had Clough like say to me and stuff like that, right? Next year is about like getting more involved and just doing like this the slower steps because I think that that year was like a whirlwind to go from fifteen year old straight away to sixteen the following summer. So like I said, it was just about I wanted just to kick on and go better and better, but unfortunately I went and had like the routine heart scan, which is what like you normally get because I was able to sign as a full on scholar by that season. I wasn't known as a schoolboy anymore. They were able to do the full on um, medical with me. And I went into the physio's room and like I say, because I made my debut the season before, you just think it's going to be go in, get it done, then you're back out again. And I remember I'm like sitting there and we had like the ECG, the echoes, everything like that done. And the, the fella who was doing them walked out to grab the physio and then came back in. They closed the door behind them. And I'm just laying there on the bed and they just turned around to me and they were like, um, like we found it, we found an, like an abnormality with your heart, but it's nothing to worry about. They said, like, you have a minor leak in your aortic valve, which to me, I was just like, I don't know what that even is. So I just looked at it in a way and I thought, well, can I still play football? And that is the only thing I asked him. And he goes, yeah. He said, it's something to keep an eye on. But he said, there's people like that are out there day to day living that can live with the same thing, that can live with the same condition. It's something that probably won't affect you until you're in your 70s, 80s and 90s. He said, it's something that's later down the line that could affect you. And was this the first that you'd heard? Yeah, this nothing, was the first time. Nothing prior? No, no, this was the first time I heard anything to do with me having a problem, me having heart issues and different things. And... Like I always knew like in pre-season I was like the worst runner possible. And now I just have the excuse for it. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like it was, it was it. Just couldn't get, Mike, just couldn't get something to check my fucking ticket, by the way. <laughs> that, 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 was literally, that was literally it. But like now in all seriousness, so once I just asked the, the fella, can I still play football? That's all that mattered. So he said, yeah, but he said it's something just to keep an eye on. So I start wearing heart rate monitors. I start wearing the GPS stuff and all of that. And then the fitness coach start flagging up that like heart rates when we're doing the preseason runs. So everybody's max heart rate would be 190, 195s, all different things. My max heart rate went up to 220 and the average was 203. So my heart was never coming down. So then they kind of flagged it up going, well, maybe we put two and two together here and that's the problem. So we went and gave it to a specialist. And then the specialist got back to us and said, look, we want to have him in for an MRI just to kind of check on all of this because it's not right for your heart rate to be that high regardless. So then 
I went and had the MRI and then I'm in the machine and stuff like that. I have the MRI and then afterwards the specialist pulled me in the physio and he turned around and said, he goes, look, he said on a scale of one to 10, 10 being leaking really bad and one being like, okay. He said like yours is around a seven or an eight. So, it's- so then that's where I started to raise eyebrows. Yeah. I was going, hang on, there's something not right here. So then that kind of information went on to another specialist that we were waiting to hear back from. But in all this time, I'm doing little bits of training at Derby. I'm not doing much. You're kind of like just going through the motions until all of this starts getting resolved, which was hard because, like you say, from the summer before, you're wanting just to kick on and and do all the stuff you were doing. And again, we heard back from the second specialist and they they pulled us in. They goes, but we're going to put it in touch with a surgeon. And then the surgeon will look at all the information we've got and then they'll tell you what they professionally think. So again, uh, when I had to go see the surgeon at Glenfield Hospital in Leicester, my ma, my da flew over and the physio. So we all went to Leicester together. And I remember like it was literally like sitting in a room like this and the doctor walked in and he just put his notes down on, on, uh, on his desk. And then he had like this big model heart in his hand. And he just sat with us and just goes, Roy, Mark, your heart is three times the size of what it should be right now for someone your age. And if you don't have the operation done this year, he said you're going to die. Jesus, man. And that's that's how, like, and it was a similar reaction where I like, just sat there and I thought, he can't be talking to me. Like, it was, it was literally like, kind of like, this can't be real. He went into it a little bit and he was like, well, the reason why he said your heart is coping with it so well because you're fit because of football. He said, because anybody with the state that your heart is in right now, he said, you would wake up one morning to brush your teeth, feel really tired, and he said, you'll collapse. And he said, you'll be gone. First thing I thought was, it's a good job you had this the screening. Yeah. Can you imagine if you, But that's the thing. The that, wiser, that's, 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 why, that's why sometimes now I look at it and say, the actual routine medical, sometimes like the footballers, it's a ball, like, oh, I can't be arsed, like, I feel fine. But like I was, the, I was in that position. I felt totally. I made me debut the season before. It was, it, it, it was, it was, it was something that like I just didn't know how to get my head around. But I think being sixteen again, like stupidly or not, all I asked the surgeon, I goes, "Oh, so can I still play?" And he goes, "Mark," he said, "Like, look," he said, "You'll need the operation done this year," and he said, "You'll be lucky to play down the park with your friends." He said, "Let alone," he said, "play professionally anymore." He said, "Like, you might as well." He said, "Get." to the idea that football's finished. And was that worse news for you than the, how bad it actually were? Yeah, because like in my head, I just seen it as it's an operation, right? Get yeah. over it. And then whatever, like I didn't know, because as I said, it probably went in my favour being 16 and naive that I didn't understand what open heart surgery was and where all of them different things were. So like I said, when when I ended up getting to that point, he, he went through the options of what operation I can have, what can be the best like success rate all of these different things so i remember we ended up um he said like there can be a procedure where he said we swap the two valves around from your lung valve to your aortic valve and he said it just means it will last longer because it's your own tissue but then at later date you're gonna have to have an operation for the lung valve so i was like no i don't want that one and then he said we can either put a pigskin valve in he said there's only a guarantee of maybe a year to a maximum of five years on that or it was a metallic valve which would be a metal valve, but I'd be have to I'd have to be on blood thinners for the rest of my life. So on blood thinners, you're not allowed to play contact sport. So I said, right, I'll go for the pixian valve. Now he said, Mark, this isn't a guarantee. He said, like this doesn't mean because you get this, you're gonna be back playing. He said, you'll have to get your head around that you probably won't play professionally again. But even though the longevity of the of the metallic, you still want that that one chance of. Yeah. playing football and that's that's, and, the, and that's, that's where sort of I was at forefront of your mind yeah like that's that's where I was at where at all like that one opportunity to play at Watford like I did before or to do something in football like that was the that was the driving force and everything to kind of say right what's the best one to give me the best chance of playing like it wasn't what's the best one which probably should have been my answer or question was what's going to be the best one for life yeah. but my one was what's the best one to keep me playing so, remember the you... conversation sorry Chrissy the conversations with mum and dad because obviously you young lad you just play you football. Want to play. Yeah. Was your mum and dad off? Come on. They they were they were to an extent, but also on the other side of it, they, they were supportive because they were saying to me, they were like, "Look, Mark, it's it's something that is is uh, 
like they, I don't think they wanted to let me in on how severe the operation was. They were kind of just like, Mark, look, now just get your head around. You might not play again. Now don't worry. There's plenty of things. And they, like like you say, they're just trying to give me the best thing ever. But I was just adamant. And as I said, like I was strong minded even then to say, no, this is what I want because mm. I want to play. And I don't care what it takes to play. This is all I want. I suppose in terms of that mindset, you'd add whoever you see it, the best or the worst lead up to that. And you just add that taste. Yeah of what Watford and that's what I'm saying and if I didn't have Watford the decision might have been different because I didn't know what it would have been like to play in a stadium I didn't know that Derby as a club really wanted me I didn't know Clough as a manager really liked me and if I didn't have any of that feel good towards it the decision could have been right I'll just go metallic and that's football done because I don't know any different but you play at Watford you play in front of a fa like a stadium you get that buzz of what it's like to play in there in front of thousands and then all of a sudden you're thinking no this is this is all I want so you got in in the November for the op yeah the operation was six and a half hours but when you come out of it it's like that's the hardest part like the operation what I did come to learn is the easiest part going in let them do what they do it's the recovery of like your chest like that being opened up all the damn same sens uh, sensations of like the pain that you get. You can't cough, you can't sneeze, you can't laugh, you can't do anything without your chest being in agony. So you had to carry around like a very small pillow with you. So I had to carry the small pillow and like you say, you feel a sneeze coming. It's like normally it's a nice thing to go to relieve a sneeze. It's the, it's the worst feeling ever because it's just so painful. And even to turn around and you're sleeping on your back for four months straight because you're not allowed to turn on either side everything that you have to pick up would be two hands only like it was a whole change but in all fairness to Derby like they offered me a three and a half year deal um, before the operation I want to say that because oh. Derby could could have possibly said look we don't really need this yeah. you know what I mean because there's a chance that you're not going to get back there's always a chance if you do get back that something could go wrong while you're playing for Derby yeah so I think they've done fucking incredible, yeah. really. Yeah, no, and, and that's why I say I do always owe a lot to them and Clough as a manager because without Derby, I wouldn't have had a career because they stuck by me. So when I got back fit or if I had it, if I did get back fit, it was someone I wanted to give everything for. It was a club I wanted to give everything for because, like you say, they could have turned their back on it. They could have said, look, you're only a 16 year old. You only played one game. We don't really need to deal with that. Mm. But they stuck by me through everything that I had to go through. And with that, Clough himself sent me home for three months until the January so I'm spending home three months doing a bit of recovery but again how good he was he's on the phone to me family every day he's on the phone to me every day making sure I'm doing the walking seeing how I am seeing how my family are making sure they're okay making sure I'm okay and like I said with him dealing with a first team club and to still have that for for me was something that like that personal touch that yeah. he was very good with and like I said I came back in the January and then the process started of right how do you get back fit and it was new to the physios it was new to the fitness coach how do you rehab a heart because yeah. they were able to do knees ankles everything but how do you rehab a heart so to an extent they kind of just went off the knowledge they know on how to kind of get fit like how do you start from ground zero to get fit again because the recovery would be even when I had the operation I'd get up and I'd walk from here to that door and I'd have to sit down and I'd be blown like I'd literally like be wiped out so I knew it was going to be a tough task, but once I started to do the jogs, it would be like out jogging on the street with the fitness coach, Steve Haynes at the time. And we'd be out jogging every single day, every single evening. And we'd have a heart rate on me watch. And it was like, right, if I reach a certain amount, we'll walk for as long until it goes back down. Then we'll go again and we'll just keep doing that for as long as it takes to just keep going. You're scared. It, You're scared. Yeah. In that initial build-up. Because, I mean, you know... That's a difficult thing to think about as a man, but you, you're still a kid, aren't you? Yeah. You're 16. Yeah, like I, 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 I was scared, but again, I'd like because I was 16, like I didn't understand it. So like I just, I just went off how everybody else acted around me. I was only able to pick Fair up yeah. on. So when everybody else and the fitness coach and people were saying, "Look, we'll do this and we we'll do that," I just followed. So I was just go, "Yeah, that's no problem. I'll do that." Did you always remain that positive, or was there any days when you just thought, "This is"? There was a couple of days. Um, it was more. It was more often than not. It was when I was getting back into training. So doing all that slow, steady jogging, I had the enthusiasm and the positivity to be like, "Yeah, I'm definitely gonna do it," and this is this is great. But it's when I start joining back in with actual fit lads and realised how far I probably was still behind it. Difficult knocked me a little bit from where you was as well. Yeah, imagine because you were ahead of all them lads. Yeah, and now it's like I'm playing catch up all over again. So. It was it was it was a great feeling to be 
back in with the group but it kind of knocked me confidence to kind of go I'm still far off of here from where I was making a debut I don't see how I'm going to be anywhere near it but like I said once I was able to join in it just kind of slowly came back to me again and it turned out that I was able to get match fit I was able to get training fit but any long distance stuff you could might as well count me out like there was no point in doing it but we ended up getting nearer to the end of that season it was around I think it was around February, March time we played in the academy. We played Man United on MUTV. And I remember my dad telling me, look, at, go out, enjoy yourself, whatever. Like, don't put pressure on yourself. But as I said, I was just delighted. I was thinking, I'm back playing again. I think I played 65 minutes in the game. But like, I was throwing myself in front of tackles again. Like, that natural instinct was coming back. Like, there was no fear. There was none of that kind of like, oh, hang on, don't touch my chest and don't do that. I was just throwing myself around. And that's why football for me was always kind of like, a chance to kind of come away from everything where there was no fear everything was off instinct and once I ended up getting back playing then again played another under 18s game played another under 18s game and by the end of that season I made the first team bench to Cardiff at home six months after the or is I, it I the think season it, after since so I had the operation done in the October and by that March April time I got back playing so Jeez. it would have been about seven months, eight months. It kind of felt like one of them stories that I didn't play nearly a single game all year and it felt like a successful year for me in in, a, in the strangest way. And then that kind of led me on to everything else that happened in my career. I always based it back to that to say, if I can get back from open heart, nothing else is going to stop me. Yeah. Did um, it's a difficult question to ask a 16-year-old you, but did your mindset change any in terms of having more drive to achieve it because of what you've had to go through. Yeah, like I, I think I think when I when I look back at it all now, like at, at the time I probably just went on stride for stride and just thought I'll take it in my stride and just keep going. Yeah. But I think looking back at it, it was something that definitely did kind of mould how I seen my life or seeing football. Like at 16, I grew up really really quickly look I had a lot of people saying to me you'd never know we had heart like I had had heart surgery because of the way I just kept on going and whatever someone told me to do yeah I'll go do that and so it did have like a massive mental shift in my mind in in the right ways rather than being too cautious about things that's it because if how old were you when you did your cruise ship I was 18 so if you see a young lad doing his cruise ship at 18 you think fuck me that, that's you're throwing the worst aren't you I'm, I'm yeah. done but you must have just seen it as another Small yeah, obstacle. The road. yeah, yeah. Like, and, and that's the thing like that's why it was like when I done when I done my ACL like I played from at the beginning of that season all the way till all the way till Christmas because first team yeah first team but I think it was the, the ACL is something that probably affected me more than the open heart surgery because I can't control my heart having an ACL affected me more because I was taught I'm wasting time here yeah. I'm wasting time with this knee injury like what am I doing this can't be happening to me and it probably that got me down worse than what the open heart surgery did so it was difficult but then my mind had to shift from that to go from yes I can sit and be devastated that it's happened to me like everybody does but I was able to look at it differently and say right well now when I get back from this because it was never a doubt I never doubted if I'd get back or not because you are actually like flying aren't you you're 17 18 year old and you're playing in Derby's first team yeah and and, and that's what I mean and and at that at that time, like you say, like you, you feel as though the world's at your feet. Like I'm doing really well and I'm delighted with everything. And you're going out playing in front of stadiums, like you're running your career, you're doing exactly what you wanted to do. And like you say, it it's something where when that injury comes about, it's like it, it just knocked me for six, but it like double knocked me for six because not only did I not get to play, everything was on a time scale. So the next heart scan might have done. ACL is done and now all of a sudden the next heart scan could say oh by the way your heart's leaking again and then I have to stop football as well as an ACL so everything I wanted to just try and squeeze out as much as I could in my career as fast as I could because like you say it was something that was never always going to probably go the whole the whole like nine yards of going to 35 40 years of age was Cootsie was he injured at the same time Paul Cootsie I think I think it was I think it was the second time around when I had like um I got back from the ACL and it was the second time around I done like I had a microfracture in the same knee that they missed. Talk about Frank the Tank. <laughs> Cootie's mark two, isn't it? Do you know what? Cootie is someone where I've never I've never met anybody who like turns into like some sort of jujitsu UFC fighter after a night out. <laughs> Loves wrestling. <laughs> like it's nothing to do with like he's gonna stand up and fight somebody. It's literally he just would 
have someone in a chokehold. Like I remember there was like a time in Derby before and like there was people going back and forward and these lads like were trying to have a go. So some of our lads like just kind of ran after them. And as they ran after them, we're turning around and go, where's Kilty? He's back in the middle of the street, like with his legs wrapped around someone in like big cobra <laughs> hole in the middle of the street, choking someone. And we're like, Kilty, what are you doing? Like, and this was like meant to be a straight up fight. <laughs> oh, like I said, like... Tap out, tap out. Yeah, that's literally what it is. And he do, and like, he, he used to do it like with lads in the squad. Like you have any sort of drink in him. I'll take you on a scrap, wouldn't I? And then he just wants to wrestle. And he'll just keep wrestling and wrestling until he wins and just goes, that's me. Because any time he was injured, all he'd done was bicep curls. <laughs> like, he'd be in there every day. Like everywhere else is like as skinny as can be, but he's just walk around with arms like that and just <laughs> thinks he's the, the biggest man ever. But he is he is Frank the Tank like times <laughs> two. Like it's crazy. <laughs> Bywater was into it as well, wasn't he? All that, the MMA and all that. Oh, I, yeah. yeah. I remember when, like, when we got introduced to him, didn't we? And he was just like, look, lads, if I wasn't a football, I'd be a UFC fighter. And then that, and that already just was a telltale sign of, like, what you were in for when he was a keeper. But I remember, like, there was days you're going into the training ground. And it got to a stage where, obviously, like, Clough wasn't having them and these different things. But he'd park his card and all these random like angles and everything so you go into the training ground every morning you just always want to go in early to go where does he park today <laughs> so we had like a physio Matt Brown and he used to drive a Prius now like he wasn't the smallest let's say of of physios so he would park really close to the driver's side because you know the way the Prius <laughs> has that middle panel so he'd pass to it so Matt Brown at the end of every day would have to go over to the passenger side to climb over <laughs> to get in and then there'd be other mornings where Stephen Boywater's coming into the training ground and he'd come in at half six if the physios are in at seven. And he moved like the physio's desk, computer, laptop, chair, everything into the gym, plugged it all in and that was his office for the day. <laughs> As he said, that fat fucker won't be able to find that. He's never been in there before. <laughs> so like he started doing all stuff like that. And like you say, he he was good. Like when we knew, we all knew what he was doing like, and he took it even to the extreme of like the manager's parking area, like where the manager parks his cars. He just parked diagonally across every last spot from him, the assistant manager and manager. Just, he just got to the point where he was just like, look, if you was going to treat me like this, I'm going to be exactly the same. And then he'd go for a jog around the training ground, which is a big enough training ground, but there used to always be a hill on the far side because the man you go, get out of me. So you just go for the jog. <coughs> so he'd jog around the training ground, but he'd bring two yoga mats with him. So we'd go over onto the far hill. He'd have a sleep for an hour and come back and go, "Oh, that was a tough one." <laughs> <laughs> but like that—that's what I mean. Like he—he was—he was someone where he, he was great to have around. He was great with all the lads. But like you say, he was someone that you wouldn't want to—you wouldn't want to cross like on on a bad day. Not at all. He was it's scary. It was it, 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 a lunatic, isn't it? Yeah, he, he is. Because I remember there was one even a day in training. Like I think Clough might have even got scared because. One of the lads were running through on goal. He comes diving out at their feet and the striker pulls out. Clough stopped the session. He pulled us all in. What the fuck do you think he's doing? He said, I want you to train as you play. So he said, when you're going in with the keeper, fucking kick his head off. So then everyone just kind of went quiet. And boy, what comes in? Sorry, Gaff. But uh, anybody kicks my head off, I'm going to rip all his heads off his shoulders, including yours. And then Clough said, right, lads, come back out of I'm sick of Jesus. <laughs> Like that, that's the kind, like you say, that's the person he was. He was like very black and white, which he was so straight. Like I, I got on really well with him, but he is one of them kind of people where you wouldn't like to make him angry. Yeah. Do you like his trips away, Clough? Loved his trips away. Loved his trips away. It was normally the first, the first international break was always Marbella. And I was only... 18 at the time so there was like the youngsters get to go and when you go on that you're kind of like it's officially a part of the force team and I remember we went away on this one and we were at a beach club at the time and at the beach club like you say we're all sitting there and on the main beach there's like banana boats there's this there's that all those like little things you can go on the back of jet skis and everything so there's this banana boat and like I'd say there's a squad of 25 lads people in the middle oil of it people on the left the people on the right and the man was like no no too many and we were like fuck off just drive <laughs> like, just no, drive. like, like nobody like nobody cared <laughs> literally nobody cared so your man your man at the, at like must have got to the stage where he was like right fuck it so he, he done it and then he spun us off so quick so then forced flip over everyone was like oh what's going on here so we all climbed back on but there's people still hanging over the edge as we're still climbing uh, as your man starts going off so then as he turns again obviously uh there was Chris Riggett and Jake Buxton were sitting at the back 
So then as they flip over, like Chris Riggett's shoulder cracks into Jake Buxton's eye socket. So then they're bobbing up and down in the water. Banana boat flipped. We get another emergency boat out. So we're all on the side. Gareth Roberts, who was the left back at the time, is getting sick over the side of the boat. Jake Buxton like doesn't realise how big the cut is on his eye. It's just washing his face with salt water. <laughs> Chris Riggett is thinking his shoulders are like dislocated. And we're all sitting there going, we're fucked. <laughs> like, and I'm only like a young 18-year-old thinking like, what's going on here? But you're just going along with the whole lot of it. But then obviously we found out that Jake Buxton fractured his eye socket at the time. So he was out for two weeks, I think, two, three weeks, like prolonged. And they had to just come out and say, oh, they were at a training camp and someone ca- clashed with him. But we all knew like we were on a banana boat with 20, 27 <laughs> lads and we just flipped and someone fell <laughs> on top of them. Like. But like you say, like the trips that we had. And then we had another player, um, Jimmy O'Connor, another Frank the Tank. But we never knew that. So... He used to always like come in and he's like a bubbly fella, like full of laugh. Like he's great, great lad. And we go away to Marbella and he's thinking, oh, this is brilliant. So what do we do over here? Yeah, we just get to go out. We're in at eight o'clock for breakfast and we have to be in for eight o'clock at dinner. Anything else in between, just go do what you want. So we thought this is brilliant. And he goes out on the night out and then he starts drinking. I would know where we walk into Lineker's bar and there's poles and all that and he has his top off he's swinging around poles and everything we're thinking Jimmy what is going on here we've only just started the night this is at the beginning of the week so then it goes into the next night and we just thought right we're gonna like get him drunk again we're gonna like start getting seeing what, seeing what he's capable of <laughs> then all of a sudden he just went missing and then we start walking to this nightclub and now I know where he's running down the main street there's a car parked like at the traffic lights and he's doing like a front dive over all car park bonnets and everything <laughs> like that. And this is like as at traffic lights, just going over cars that are stu- like stopped at traffic lights. And then all of a sudden there was another set of cars on the far side, opening up doors to try and go through the back and crawl over people to get out the other side. <laughs> and go, just standing there. Has he got an audience or has he just on his own? No, he was on his own doing it at the time. <laughs> but we all caught him. I was thinking the same thing. But we all, we all caught him <laughs> doing it. That's what I'm saying. Like, so we, when we were all walking there, then all of a sudden he was like, would stand on the top of a car and he'll do like a front roll down like the windscreen of the car and we're all just looking thinking what is this fella so then the next morning he get he like he woke up because he went missing after that and he said as you know what happened last night because he said i woke up and all my clothes are soaked and he said i have all these scratches on me he said i think i dived into a bush but i don't know what happened he said i think i dived into the pool or the marina but he said and he is remember we were like jimmy you left but do you remember going across park cars and everything like that and he was like Nah, lads. He said, I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> but like, like you say, as if you're walking down the street in Marbella and think, fuck it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump over that car. I like him, yeah, I like him. I do. That's that's that he's not got an, yeah, that's it. The fact he's not got an audience makes it better. Yeah, and that's what you're I mean. Just it, was just, it, was, it was the own fact that we all seen him and stuff like that. And like you say, we had we had a couple of people like that, even on Christmas parties. There was um, Sack Whitbread we had in on loan from Leicester at the time. Centre half, yeah, or Norwich, yeah, yeah. That's the one we had him in on loan. And again, like I said, it seems like that we just signed loads of Frank the Tanks. But this was an, another one that, like, he let he let it be known that he said, like, look, after a couple of drinks, he said, leave me to me on the voices. Warning. He said, yeah. like, just leave me. So we were in this nightclub in Scotland, and Zach's just roaming about, but like just blank expression, like he's obviously pissed, but doesn't recognise any player that he's with. <laughs> and like he's just he's just walking around like different places in the in in the nightclub. So then all of a sudden, I say about an hour passes, someone comes running down and goes, "Where's Zach's jacket? He's up at the he's up the bouncers won't let him back in. Where's his jacket?" So we were like, "I think that's his jacket there." Right. So then one of the lads said they brought it back up, but by the time he got back up, he has like split open in his forehead. Don't know what happened, and he's over the front of a police bonnet. So we're thinking, what has gone on here? So then all of a sudden, apparently, like he got his jacket and wherever. So then it was on the Monday we got back into training and Zach is still nowhere to be seen. So then we ended up getting like this message in our group chat, just going, lads, sorry, I'm just too embarrassed to come back in. Like, look, I think I'm going to just knock the long move on the, on, on the head and everything. So we're thinking he's like, what's going on here? Like, we thought he got locked up or something. He goes, I'm going to just knock the long move. But then after the text, he came back in on the Tuesday. So you're like, Zach, what's going on? So he has stitches going across his forehead, like two little like angry lines right in the middle of his forehead. And we were like, what happened? And he was like, look, he said, I don't really know. He said, well, I do know. So on that night when he got like his jacket back, because I think he was getting aggressive and that's where the police like held him. So then he got a taxi from Scotland all the way back to Leicester. 
650 quid later he just goes you know what he said once i woke up the next morning and realized that i was back in my house in leicester he said i couldn't show my face ever again and that long message that came in saying lad sorry about the loan mill but I'm, i think i'm gonna have to knock it on the head we just <laughs> burst out laughing thinking, this fella has completely gone a wall and this was all just because he had a drink <laughs> can you imagine going for that and waking up in your own bed <laughs> in, a, in another country <laughs> I, the normal people do this like the, the normal folk jump over cars and there's like, always a few odd balls, isn't there? You'd like to think so, but like I've I don't, never I don't seen know. Anybody, I've been out lots and lots of times. Yeah. And I've never seen anybody rolling over cars and stuff. <laughs> You're right, no, it, it is. It's better that he just thought, yeah. I'm going to take myself off here and, like, <laughs> and have a bit of fun. <laughs> yeah, like going like that, the people in the cars. <laughs> but that's what I mean. It was, it was like, it was literally to the point of just going, look, at, this is me on holiday. Like this, this is me just on holiday. <laughs> and like the fact that we actually had to catch him doing all that, and it wasn't the fact that we don't go on, Jimmy, jump yeah, over yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Jimmy, jump over that. Yeah. But like you say, we we did we signed some like good good characters, but like that's why the group from 25 to 18, everybody was so close because of stuff like that. Yeah. And like you say, sometimes nowadays you don't get that anymore. Gaston and Crosby must have been on pins. Huh? They yeah. must have been on pins having make what? another phone call back. Because <laughs> it's just a stag do, isn't it? <laughs> and can you imagine just, oh, somebody else had turned up? What, but that's a phone call as a manager you never expect to receive, isn't it? Somebody's done that. Somebody's fractured the cheekbone. How have you done it? Have you gone for banana <laughs> bone? <laughs> what? The full squad was on there. <laughs> <laughs> they were doing it as team building. They were all there. <laughs> wonder what Nigel did. Why well, everybody's aware. Retreat, spa retreat, or something in R and R. Was it always playing sailing with him? Did he ever dig you out for performances or anything? Yeah, um, it was it, it was plain sailing, like he, to an extent, where if he liked you, he was probably harsher on you. So I remember it was when I was coming back from the ACL, we were playing Peterborough away. And as we were playing Peterborough, like the game's going on, I'm on the bench. And there was about 20 minutes to go. Jake Buxton got sent off. So it's my first game back. Clough was like, right, you're going on 20 minutes. Centre back. So the lads were pushing for an equaliser and then there was just me and one of the other lads, I think it was um, Sean Barker at the time, playing at the back. And they shot from about 25 yards. Our keeper went to catch it through his hands, 2-0. So you're thinking, right, uphill battle. So then literally everyone was just like going for it, like trying to push for that next goal for us. So then the ball come to me on the halfway line and I tried to slide it down the side of uh, their defence. Their defender intercepted it, played it over top. Berahino runs in, scores 3 0. And then the referee blows the whistle. So when I'm just thinking to myself, I know I've like fucked up here. So he comes in at the end of the game. He was like, Roy, he said, I don't condone getting sent off. He said, That's silly from one of my experienced players. He said, But when you go 1 0 down, he said, and especially in the position that we define ourselves in the league, goal difference is massive. You don't go 2 0 down. And that's over to you and laid into the keeper. So then I'm sitting here thinking, I'm next. <laughs> <laughs> so then all of a sudden he turns around and goes, and when you go 2-0 down, you don't go fucking three. And that's you, you Irish fucker. And turned around and just goes, see you. I was looking forward to having you back off your injury. But you know what? See if you think you can pass a ball now. See if you think you're a bit of a player. He said, that's when you're fucking shit. He said, I've brought you into this team to kick it and fucking head it. See, when you think you can pass it, I might as well get your contract and fucking rip it up. <laughs> so the next time you think of passing the ball, you're fucking off back to Ireland. Understand? And I goes, yep. Yeah. <laughs> and I just thought, he fucking must hate me. <laughs> but then he ends up uh, storming out. All the lads are coming around like, look, He's obviously saying that to you because he was like he wants more from me and he wants the best from me and stuff like that. But I was sitting there and I'm just thinking, he hates me. He definitely hates me. And there's another time he digged me out. We were playing Burnley at home. Charlie Austin up front. So we ended up going one nil up. The ball gets cleared away from their box. And as I'm running back towards my goal, the ball's bouncing and Charlie Austin is chasing down behind me. But I don't know if it was just instinct, but at the time it was like the ball was bouncing about this height, so it wasn't high enough to kind of head back to a keeper, but it wasn't low enough that I could try and pass it. So as it was coming down, I've kind of flicked it, and Charlie Austin's ran right underneath it. It looked unbelievable. <laughs> and it's gone over his head, and I played it out from the back. And half time in the game, Noiser Clough again 
what the fuck do you think you were doing at the back there? <laughs> and my first answer was just, I said, I don't know. And he goes, you're a fucking professional football and you don't know what you were doing <laughs> on a pitch. There's something wrong there. There's something wrong there. For that answer, you're lucky I don't fucking take it off. And I thought, oh, Jesus, so I can't really make any more mistakes here. But again, I watched back the, I watched back that video clip before and I still look at it now and go, what was I even thinking? This looks unbelievable. <laughs> like straight at me Instagram. Sounds and I was like, what are you going mad at me for? This actually looks <laughs> unbelievable for a young 18 year old. Sounds like you're doing fucking very well. <laughs> and then and then all of a sudden, but the the commentary straight out the commentary on it is um Mark O'Brien has done really well and Nigel Clough is furious on the sideline <laughs> like oh Jesus <laughs> but yeah like, like I said he, he, like you do take him for what he is like if he likes you whether he has a go at you or not he's willing to just stick with you and stick with you it's Would to he? the point if he falls out which he doesn't Is there much difference between him and McLaren yeah there was a massive difference I, I feel like under Clough Clough matured me as a player to kind of like gave me that maturity like helped me on, on and off the field about what I was good at and helped me on that aspect, gave me the opportunity. But I think McLaren, I actually developed under him as an actual player to kind of understand the game a bit more about playing out from the back, what options do you have? And like when he forced come in, I just thought I'm never going to fucking play. I sh- mm. Like I don't, I, I don't know how to play out from the back. Like that was my thought process going into it. But then you've been coached not to play it from the back. Yeah. You? So you'd spent all that time under Clough keep it simple get it out you've got a new manager in and you've you you're gonna you've got to adapt your game aren't you well that's to literally suit that manager yeah and that and that's literally it and that's that was my first taste of it because all i've ever had is noisy clough as a manager i never had any other manager no other experience anywhere else so to have him in it was eye opening but i enjoyed it and like seeing what he's coaching me is actually working rather than just like being the like people you say like just heading a stick like just you just go head it and kick it and that's all you'll do whereas he was like the turning point for me to see that football is kind of on that route of changing so like he, he was good with me um and as as i said it, it didn't quite go according to plan with mclaren um i get a phone call off stuart mccall and stuart mccall is on the phone to me and he's like look we want to take it on loan which i thought was brilliant i said like and they only finished second in the sbl the season before so I was like, yeah, no, this is brilliant. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be able to get back to you. But yeah, I'll be interested in that. So I went into Steve McLaren. So I knocked on his door and I goes, Gaffer, uh, just a quick one. I said, Motherwell are looking to have me out on loan. Um, what do you think? He was like, yeah, yeah. He said, now look, he said like they finished second in the SPL. He said like they're obviously going to be a good outfit um, for you to go there. He said if it was anything less than top three, top four, he said, I'll tell you no. But he said, while well, you're already in here, sit down and shut the door. So I thought, what's going on here? So he ends up shutting the door and he just goes, so how do you think your time at Derby's been? I said, look, I've loved every minute of it. I said, I've enjoyed you being in. Um, I said, I've enjoyed, like, I said, I've had obviously a couple of up and down with injuries, but I said, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. He goes, yeah, yeah. He said, like, that's, that's something. He said, like, you started off so well. And he said, it's kind of just come to a bit of a flat line, hasn't it? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, look, we're going in a different direction. We're trying to push for a promotion. We're trying to push for things. We want more bodies in. And I think your time at Derby's come to an end. And at the time I was thinking, I've literally just come in to ask you about a loan move to Motherwell. I've not come in to ask you, like, am I actually here in your plans? So at the time I was like, I kind of said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, look, he said, like, Derby is like this circle to you. He said, and you have no other circles in your career. He said, now, for you to have a career, you need to start making circles. He said, then that experience goes into that one and that one goes into that one. And I was like, but I said, I'm in, like, I'm enjoying it here. Like, like, why do I need to go out and experience something that I'm enjoying? He goes, but he said, what I'm trying to say to you is, he said, look, we're moving on from you and we're not going to renew your contract. <laughs> so he's oh. so trying with the circles. Yeah. <laughs> the circles are not circles working. Not but work. To be fair, yeah, we think it's shit. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off to the other world. That's literally it. Yeah. That is literally it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going like, to cut to the chase. Uh, yeah, we went to his assistant. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll try the circle <laughs> route. <laughs> See if it falls for the circles. <laughs> but again, like I say, like he, he, he did that. He, he did that with me and. Like I came out, I came over and I remember going into the change room with the lads and the lads were like, how did that go? And I was like, I'm leaving. I said, I'm done. And they were like, what, what, do you mean, what do you mean you're done? And I was like, well, I said, I went in to find out about the loan move and he said like, me time at Derby's basically done that I need to use Motherwell as the platform to move on now. Like he said, there's nothing here for me. That conversation was something that kind of knocked me. But I look back at the conversation now and, I, and like, I'm thankful for it 
because he never kept me holding on or he didn't give me false hope. He just basically said, look, this is what we think of this season. We wanted to go out and experience something different, go on out and do it. Like he wasn't someone that was saying, we definitely want you, but then never play me. Yeah. You've got to think as well, I'm, yeah, I'm on the clock. I'm on, yeah. I'm on the clock. I want to be playing as much as I can because I never know. Yeah. yeah, and that's exactly it because, as you say, like being on the clock and not knowing as you say, year after year, when's going to be the last one? You kind of just go, right, well, look, you've told me, now go to Motherwell and let's see how that is. Yeah. And that's that's the way it was. It was just go and let's see how that is. Like the first game that I went up and played there, it was just like, look, we have you up, you're starting straight away. So loved it. And then the next week after that, we played against Hamilton in the cup. But I remember in the game, I got a yellow card in um, the end of the first half. And then we got to the second half of extra time. I ended up getting a second yellow card and I got sent off. And because of how it was, the referee actually booked me at half time in the game. So I made a tackle just before he blew the whistle for half time. And as he blew the whistle, I just stormed down the down the, down the tunnel thinking, fuck, like the referee is like gonna be after me here. But just thought like he's blew the whistle. Like if, I, if he doesn't see me, I'm gonna go straight into the jail. <laughs> Quick, run them off. Go yeah, like that's what it was. <laughs> so you could see you could see people trying to pull me back and I'm just head down straight to the tunnel. But then Stuart McCall's giving his team talk, and all of a sudden you just hear knock on the door. Stuart McCall opens and goes, yeah. And he goes, um, we want number 15. And he was like, why? He goes, we need to speak to him. So Stuart McCall walked out with me, went into the referee's office and he stood there and just branded me a yellow card in his referee office. What, did he give it the full? Yeah, gave it the full back. Like, <laughs> gave, gave, gave it the actions. Like just stood there and just goes like that. And he goes, blow his whistle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, flag me. I wrote it down. I wrote it down. Uh, turn around and get your number, please. <laughs> When did he move on, McCall, or get sacked? Was it? I think, I think, I think he decided to kind of move on. Yeah. I think it was getting to the point where I think he could have been sacked, but he, I think it was his his decision to kind of move on. And he was br- like, like I say, I can't speak highly enough of him. Like he's an unbelievable like man manager. Like he's someone where you'd want to play for him. Like a hundred percent, if he's your manager, he makes you want to play for him. And then we were getting word that Ian Barraclough was coming in. Like I was in the team. But he come in and his first like ever meeting and his first thing in front of the press conference was, look, I'm I'm a new manager. It's a great challenge for me. And like, I'm not just coming here just to take part in this league. Like, I'm not coming here at all. He said, just to be another number for Celtic. He said, we're here to win the SPL. And we were all just sitting there thinking, for fuck's sake. He's like, coming in confident at least, isn't he? Yeah, he's coming very confident. Like, very, <laughs> very so confident. Foolish. <laughs> I was so foolish. I was so foolish of a confident. But... It was it was something where, like you say, that that was that was kind of the mentality that he came in with, and he felt as though he needs to bring in his own bodies, his own men, which is a bit a bit shift for the lads who were there who got second in the SPL the season, but previous to that, that he was kind of like coming in, he was picking them apart, and I was one of them that he was picking apart, and and I was in and out of the team, and he pulled me into the office and he goes, "Look, I'm gonna leave you out this week," and I was like, "Why?" and he goes, "Well," he said, "Look, we've got." One of our centre backs in, he said, and he's, I just feel as that watching the boot both years, he's got more presence than you. I said, what does that even mean? In all fairness, I said, do I get beaten in the air? And he goes, no. I said, has anyone, has anybody beaten me for pace? And he goes, no. I said, have I pulled out of any tackles? He goes, no. I said, like, what is it then? I said, just because I'm not tall. And he goes, yeah. He said, like, look, there's nothing that you've done wrong. It's just that he's that little bit taller. And I was like what do I do with that then <laughs> I said what do you want me to do like literally you're telling me to grow like, <laughs> like so like I, I, I literally sat there and I was just like but what do you want me to do then he was like no this isn't a you thing this is just something that he in my opinion he just looks better but if somebody's taller than me I said and I'm not doing any of the things wrong that you claim I should be doing better in I said this, it shouldn't be and he goes well it's just my decision so I said alright so then it was coming nearer to the end of the season and we were all like little talks here and there between things. And he said to me, he goes, look, by the end of the year, he said, you have nothing to, like, he said, you won't have anything to worry about. You should be all right. So I thought, that's fine. I said, for going forward, I said, because obviously this is me last year at Derby on loan here. Me next one has to be a contract elsewhere. So it was like the last, so we ended up staying up against Rangers. And then all of a sudden they get the result they wanted. They didn't get relegated and everything's all happy again. So again, he pulled us all in and we're all having our meetings on last day on, on the last day before we all break up and he pulls us all in and I got pulled in and uh, he sits me down and he goes Roy he said how do you think this year has gone and I said yeah I said like look from your first loan move I said 
there's things I can get better with. Like at this stage, I'm still only 21, 22. I said, like, there's things I can get better with, but I said, I think I've done all right. And he goes, yeah, he said, um, he said, yeah, we're not going to, we're not going to be keeping you on. So then I just goes, how come? And he said, well, look. He <laughs> said, he didn't get his pen and paper out of the inside, drawing another circle. <laughs> <laughs> if the circle one had it came out, it was like the writing was on yeah. the wall now. No, but he just goes like, look, he said, just that small factor of you can't train on AstroTurf, can you? And I goes, no, I said, because of me knee, which I said, you know about. And he's like, yeah. He said, when I have a squad of 18 players, he said, I want people who can train on AstroTurf, so that's why I'm not keeping you on. But like he, the reason why I never seen eye to eye with him, because he made so many excuses to me, stuff that was irrelevant. It was just to the point of, look, at, I wanted my own men in. And like I said, that's why I appreciated McLaren's honesty. And we haven't, like, and I haven't spoke with him since. I haven't come across him since. And like I said, I wouldn't want to. But at that point, like looking back at it all, that that's something where I just, I didn't, I don't have time for people who aren't willing to turn around and actually tell you the truth to your face. Rather just try and keep building your hopes. And like I say, I look back on my 21 year old with me hopes up thinking this is me last year at Derby, I need a contract. Tell you I'm going to be okay to then tell me I'm not. The next trip for me was just home to Ireland and just hope I was going to get a deal somewhere or somebody hopefully noticed me. And that was, that was, that was tough. Nothing like my phone wasn't ringing off the hook because in all fairness, when you look back at the past history, there's someone with an open heart surgery, ACL, like didn't play much at Derby, microfractures, didn't get a loan move. It got to around like the 29th, 30th of June. And my agent goes, I think Luton might be in, uh, might be interested in you. You think that anybody who phones Nigel Clough or Stuart McCall up, they're just going to sing your praises anyway? You know what I mean? Yeah, you'd like to think so. Like that's something where you would like to think so. But then also on the other side, for their own for their own credibility they'd have to be realistic and go well look he does have his injuries he does have this and then it's down to a manager's opinion on me based as an injury rather than seeing me as a player mm. and do you know them the, the six month scans when did they always fall was it always do you have them at the start of the season or the end of the season you know, it would you... always be at the end of the season so like some like at the beginning it was every six months so it would be end of season then it would be January, February time, then it would be into the following summer and it would just keep continuous that way. And then when everything and the progress was going really well, it would end up being a year's scan. So it would go from the end of that season into the end of the next season. And then that's the way my yearly scans just went. And like I said, my whole career was based on that. So when I, when I, when I was getting to three, four, five years time, and then they were still turning around to kind of go, oh no, everything's fine. And then you go to your next year. So it was always that kind of make or break. But it was, I remember we got to around like the seventh or eighth year and I remember the doctor even turned around and said to me and I played on my mind a little bit and I was just thinking like, did you fucking mean that? Like, had the scan and stuff like that and the doctor turned around and goes, no, everything's looking well. Jesus, we must have given you a good one. And I thought, are you fucking me on here or what? <laughs> and, I thought, and I thought, that's not something you want to tell someone who's just about to go. But like I said, I said, thankfully you fucking did give me a good one because like I said, I kind of exceeded their expectation of everything being in a professional environment, pushing myself every day and still playing. <laughs> you must have still had that anxiety though before everyone. Of, of oh yeah. Say this time. Because like no matter what season I had previous, there was either stuff I could have done better where I thought I want to keep going again so I want to get better and it literally could be that or the pull the rug moment to kind of say you're done and that was something that was always in my mind and I always feared it I never wanted it to happen so that's why I probably got so scared and afraid going to them because I never wanted to hear it I always thought the further I stay away from hospital if I don't hear it it's not happening and it was like I got I got into a comfort zone of hearing it's okay it's okay it's okay because then when I did get hit with the news, that's not okay. It just knocked me like it, like knocked me for six. I was like completely down and out. It was, it was, it was the worst feeling I've ever had. And that on itself is, like you say, that feeling of getting told, look, your heart is leaking again was one. But then me knowing the repercussions of when it's leaking again and what that means is what hit me most than actually hearing the open heart surgery again. It was to the, to the point of this time was I couldn't see the positivity side of it. I couldn't see, oh, well, if I bounce back from this because there was no bouncing back, it was your football's finished. And I sat with the doctor and I just burst into tears. Like I sat there crying to the doctor and he goes to me, no, like there's, diff- like, tr- th- there's different procedures we can possibly do for you. And I was like, no, I said, I need to go for, for a metallic valve now. I said, my career is done. And he was like, look, 
he said like you've had a good run at it blah blah and all them and I just thought what am I going to do now like I've lived my whole life from the age of 16 till now just to play football like I've gotten nothing like I've never I've never experienced that anything like that feeling before because like I say I was disappointed with injuries but again I had football to come back to when I had the forced open heart surgery I had football to come back to when I had other injuries or when I got let go from a different team for the opinion of a manager I had football to come back to this time and this one and only time I didn't have that to come back to and I didn't know what I was going to do but then because I was older and I'm and I was 27 and because I was older I look at it now and go at the age of 27 I understand open heart surgery now I understand the procedure I understand the consequences of if something goes wrong I understand everything and that was scarier than when I was 16 because at 16 it was like well I don't I don't know I don't care yeah. like I understand what you're saying right now and this is the scariest thing I've ever had to go through because this time around is something that is probably the hardest one because I was feeling all the effects I was getting breathlessness I was getting dizzy I was getting tired I was waking up like fatigued this was during COVID so everything was in lockdown football had finished I started getting really frustrated with everything and the more I got frustrated I was just thinking now this something's not right so I found the doctor again he goes doc you're gonna have to get me a scan he goes look he said obviously because it's COVID it's hard to get in but he said leave it with me he said I'll get you in so three days later he got me a scan and after he got me the scan he turned around and I went in for it and he goes look it's probably going to be nothing so then this doctor come out after the scan he goes Mark look your heart is leaking and he said it's leaking very badly he said like your, your valve is hanging on by a thread he said and you need an operation as soon as possible it was the first time anybody ever spoke to me with any sort of concern towards my heart he said you need to have an operation as soon as possible so then as time was going on I started to develop like anxiety I wasn't sleeping I started like to like be afraid to sleep because I thought I'm not going to wake up so I, I tried to just stay awake constantly and then only the way that I would sleep would be exhausted and I just like pass out of sleep and wake up and go in a, in a big fright and then I ended up I had a panic attack which I never ever knew what a what a panic attack was like I had one of them sitting in my apartment because me my ma was over with me because anything that goes on like the first person you call it was always my ma my ma would fly fucking halfway around the world for me if, if i needed that i remember i was sitting there watching the telly and i just felt my head starting to lift like i was just getting dizzy i goes ma i can't see she goes give me a hand so i'm sitting there holding my ma's hand and i was like ma my heart's racing and like my heart is thumping i'm sweating like my hands are getting clammy and i thought i'm having a heart attack here so they found an ambulance and the ambulance came i went into the hospital and they said no look at like your valve is what it is but um, it was just a panic attack. There's no progression on what your heart was. It's a, it's a panic attack. I said, what's a panic attack? They said, like, literally, they said, it's the same symptoms, everything of a heart, of a heart attack, but just the fact you're not having one. It started, time dragged on a little bit. So we got to around June time, went up to Leicester and Glenfield. And going up to Leicester and Glenfield, um, the doctor took one look at me, admitted me in on the day they seen me. They were like, no, we were taking you in. So got taken in. And it was middle of June, I'd say middle of June, like I'm in and the doctors are trying to figure out a date to get me in because the during COVID, like the operation theatres and hospitals were like packed out and everything. So they were trying to, I was on a side ward and my ma was like traveling back and forward from Newport to, to Leicester and stuff like that. And nobody's allowed in the hospital. So I'm literally in the hospital by myself. It was starting to get to a point where I think it was a week before my operation. They came in and said, look, next Thursday we can we can do the operation for you. So I thought, this is brilliant. Next Thursday, grand. But I was getting to the point where like I've, I've spent like nearly two weeks in hospital already and I was kind of shitting myself because I was seeing older people coming in and out, scars in the chest, other people going in before me. And I just thought, I'm like just sitting, waiting, like I'm a waiting duck here. You getting any more panic attacks? Or? No, because I think one of the main reasons why panic, panic attacks came because I was away from hospitals I was away from security yeah. like hospital felt secure for me so you said that oh, fear of going to sleep yeah and, and all that anxiety building up yeah and all of that kind of went away when I was in hospital because I felt as though if anything goes wrong here I'm in the best place yeah so yeah. I was kind of felt comfortable almost but it's again, almost like the real like the severity of it it's not about am I going to play football again like it was the first time <laughs> yeah now that it's this, about... this one is the severity of the life and death situation yeah. and like like I said, the naive 16-year-old isn't here anymore. It was actually me fearing, like, I don't want Life. to actually die. Yeah. 
and we ended up um it was a week before the operation and i think it was on the the monday it was monday night and one of the doctors are walking past and i feel i felt myself starting to sweat and as i was sitting there and i just buzzed i buzzed the doctor and they ran in and goes what's up and i goes i feel as though like there's something not right here i said i feel really sick so then they push me onto a side ward and um, they do all the tests on me. They go, Mark, look, I, it's come back from you. Like you're testing your urine. We think you've got an infection. So if you do have an infection, you can't have the operation Thursday because we can't operate with the infection. So that in itself added more panic to me again and wherever. So they thought I had an infection called endocarditis, which is an infection of the valve. And because my valve was already leaking and it was in a really bad way, they said an infection on that, they said you'd be dead. So like I'm like two, three days in, like I'm on a drip with penicillin going into my arm. I'm taking all tablets possible to get my temperature down. So it got to Wednesday, the day before the operation. And the doctor came in that evening. And the doctor came in and he was like, look, Mark, he said, we're going to, he said, we get the results back tomorrow. He said, and if we, if we get the results back, he said, we'll find out when, like, if you can have the operation or not. But he said, like, literally, your valve, he said, is hanging on, he said, literally, by a thread. So I got moved from this point now, I'm on the main ward being looked after. So, like, I'm in with all the patients who have just had operations to me being here waiting for mine, but I'm on the main ward, hooked up at all the machines. And they swore to me and he goes, right, the reason why we need to have you on watch is because if your valve through the night breaks off, and he said, if that circulates around your body and gets lodged in your brain, he said, you're dead. So he's basically stood there and told me, Mark, you've got basically 24 hours to know whether you have the operation and potentially live or if this breaks off, you're gone. So again, I didn't fucking sleep that night. Like I literally like probably slept for 20 minutes, if that. And I remember like the next morning I got woken up at like seven o'clock, the doctor's coming around and he goes, right, Mark, got some good news for you. You don't have an infection. We can do the operation today. And like when you don't think you have that much stress or anxiety on your shoulders the minute he told me that everything just like i just went weak from head to toe like and just start crying like grabbed his hand like if i could have got up and done it like running or run around the ward celebrating or jumped over a ford cortina or something like that <laughs> i'm down, down, down a windscreen <laughs> but like like i say it was like that emotion of actually thinking like one time it changed my perspective a lot because the first time I'm I'm actually worried about having open eyes already this time I'm celebrating inside to say yeah. thank god I can have this because I knew how close I was to something like badly going wrong where I, if like they hit the nail on the head like I could have died so when he told me they could have it like they drugged me all up and as I'm getting wheeled down the the corridor like when no parents allowed in the hospital, it was all like all of this was through the phone with my man and Dan, everybody, and it was difficult. But when I was getting wheeled down, my man ends up, I end up seeing my man like some scrubs and stuff like that. She pulls the mask, like you know, like Mister Bean in the scene, <laughs> he pulls the mask down and waves. Like I'm getting wheeled down for the operation, my man just pulls the mask down and she, she sneaked, she sneaked in like <laughs> yeah, like one one of the nurses who like because my man said I don't care what she's telling me when he's going in for that, I'm I'm in the hospital. So they done what the best they could. So they kind of like kitted her out. They kind of say, look, uh, you sit in the corridor, but make sure you wear this. And so I knew my ma was there when I was getting wheeled in. So I'm laying like in the main theater and you're seeing lights like this, lights there, massive screens, cameras, 25 doctors around the place. And I'm literally sitting there and you're getting padded up with everything. And like I started to kind of sit there and just think, fuck, there's no backing out now. Like literally this is, this is it. And they put me asleep and this time the operation took seven and a half hours it took like an extra hour and as i said I, I, I you wake up in intensive care and you don't know any different than it's like seven hours later and the first thing that like i drink some water and stuff like that and on the phone to my man like the first thing i say is like, all i said to my mom was like okay, i'm alive everything's okay i'm alive and then that's all and then hangs the phone up and like you say you just after that the Complete recovery changing perspective yeah like like and i never thought i'd have need to have perspectives like that at the age of 27 like going through one of them but like the second one changed perspectives for life like it changed to the point of going like look that was literally forget football now like that kind of helped me to an extent over the retirement for for the time being to kind of say forget about this like there's more there's more important stuff and i look at it and it was difficult because 
the, the, the recovery as again, what I knew at 16 is just as hard, if not harder. And I suppose last time you still had this, this drive inside that you wanted to play football again. Yeah. Can I just take these tablets because it's gone past six o'clock? Oh, <laughs> fucking hell, take them quick. For fuck's sake. <laughs> quick break, gents, to bring a message from NordVPN once again. And they have a very good offer. They do have a very good offer. What have we got, Chris? Three months free and money back guarantee if you don't like it. But I can't imagine why you wouldn't like it. 30 day? 30 day money back guarantee. Still wow. blows my mind this, you know. If you're not aware of NordVPN, which you just bank your location anywhere in the world. So you can watch, uh, if you want to watch in football games that are on, in that are only being shown in certain other countries, or maybe there's TV shows that aren't available in the country that you are currently residing. Well, just bounce that location, get yourself involved. So for the for uh, people who are like me, bouncing your location means you're sat at home in Barnsley. Oh, I want to. I want to. Maybe you want to watch a game, or you want to watch a TV show that's only being shown in Argentina. Right. You're bouncing your IP location, your internet location to that country and you can watch it. So my computer thinks I'm in Argentina. Yes. Right. Just just for the for well, people who don't know what bouncing location means. Yeah. And then you can watch that game. Right. And the security elements as well to know VPN because all them passwords, your bank details, everything that you want to keep under lock and key, Nord, sort that out. It's like having some personal bodyguards, bouncers. I'm that. sure you'd agree, John. It's imperative this day and age. Three months free, 30 day money back guarantee. What more do you need to know? Links are in the description. Just well, click it. Any clearer. Clickety click, off you go. Sign yourself up. Three months free. So when did you when did you actually see your mum again? So like when I when I was in the hospital, um, and like during the recovery, like I was FaceTiming and I'm walking up the corridors, the doctors are coming in. Cause like when when you're um coming out of like intensive care i was in there for like a day and then they take you straight out they put you on a ward but then the physio comes straight in and says okay we're going for a walk and like i have three tubes coming out of my stomach tubes coming out of my neck i've got like a little defib thing connected to my heart and they pick up all the equipment then you go like literally walk from here and you take four steps and they say right turn around back as as the day has passed like you're going out with the physio every so often and you're back and forward into bed but i'd go out for a five minute walk and sleep for like two hours after because i'd be just completely wiped so i got to a point where like i'm facetime away from family and i'm going out on walks and like they're texting me and calling me and i'm all the calls from the lads and stuff like that and how are we getting on now and send the picture to the scar and stuff like that saying look i'm doing all right for myself and the tubes have been taken out today and that that even in itself is is probably like the worst feeling I've ever felt. Like taking like the only way I was able to describe it, it's like being stabbed in reverse. Mm. It's like they're already in there and it's like, right, we're taking these out now. So breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. And as you breathe out, they pull the first one. And then they close it up, stitch it up, and they do it with all of them. So like they done it with the tubes in my stomach. And then they had to take the defib thing that was connected to my heart, which is just two clips on the end of my heart, just in case anything went wrong. Like, right, well, your heart's at a steady heart, right? We can take them out now. So they're pulling this wire out of my chest and everything like that. And then they pulled the one out of your neck. He goes, right, we've got one more. I was like, what do you mean fucking one more? I forgot I had a cat, one of those catheters in. So straight away, they just lifted up the sheets. They go, right, now breathe in, breathe out. And I just start, and I was like, what the <laughs> fuck's going on here? But again, you're up, you're straight to the toilet. And once you're off them, you kind of know, right, they're, they're kind of happy enough for everything at the moment. And then it got to about... A week after the operation, a week and a half, the discharge nurse came around and she was like, Roy, we're looking to, we're going to get you out in the next few days. And I was like, oh, that's grand. So like they're telling me what tablets to take. Like, cause I'm, I'm on blood thinners now every day for the rest of my life. I'm on. Is that what they were? Yeah. So then the ones that I just take and where the blood pressure, like I have to take them at six or seven o'clock every day. And I have to take um a blood pressure tablet first thing every morning for the rest of my life. But at the time like it felt like it, that was like way too much like i was just thinking like oh, what happens if i forget to take them what about this what about that like and i was always really really panicked and they were telling me about like the the strengths and the levels and everything and i was thinking this is well too, too much, much like i just thought it was going to be in. one tablet done but i was like right but if you need to take eight milligrams that's a three and a five or you could do a three three and two ones and i'm just like the fuck's all this like th like i can't be dealing with this and i remember i was on the phone and I was saying to him, I said, I can't do this, man. Like, I can't do this. And she was like, look, she said, it's not as bad as it seems. It's all new to you. You'll be fine. So 
again and even the sensation of like the ticking of my valve and how it is in my chest and all of these different things it's like all of that sensation was totally different because i remember the first night when i was laying in the bed and i could just keep hearing this click but i didn't know what i thought was the clock above my bed so the next morning the doctor came around and i look back at it now and it's the shittest joke a doctor could have ever told me he like he's on top like he comes in he goes right mark how was your night and i was like yeah it was all right and he was just like have you heard your valve yet and i goes is that that ticking noise and he goes yeah he said and i said oh, i thought there was a clock above my bed and he goes ah you know he said it's not a clock but he said it's when it's when when you don't hear the tick is when you need to worry and i thought <laughs> fuck? so like i'm constantly trying to listen out for it now to kind of go right is that still fucking going here to be chest and everything there's the tick like honestly and and from that point like it was just like normal procedure go out and do the walks and do what you're supposed to do and as as it comes to the point of leaving like this is like nearly six weeks seven weeks in hospital i ended up getting told you're leaving my ma came to pick me up and on the way back like i'm curled in a ball i go have to walk up two flights of stairs when i get back to newport which is like a two two and a half hour 245 uh drive flight walk up two flights of stairs wipe me out for the rest of the day and i just slept and i think i slept for about 12 hours it was like i was just completely exhausted but then that's the whole turning point of everything like i actually felt as though it got worse i i, I got worse mentally this time than it was physically i was convincing myself like from when I was in hospital that I'm going to die. Now that I'm out of hospital and things are on the up, I felt as though I was actually on the down. I felt as though I'm just hitting rock bottom. Like there's nothing that can, that, that can, that can save me. I don't have football to get me out. I've lost two stone and weight. Like literally like this is the worst that I've ever felt in my entire life. And like you say, I'm going, I'm going through it all. And the more that like, people are telling me mark no you're capable of doing that come on we'll go for a walk nah not today nah not today and then i'm on like seven or eight tablets a day i found myself getting into a hole and i didn't know like i i, I didn't know i was getting myself into a hole i thought i was doing what's best for me the least amount of walking i do the better i'm saving my heart whereas it's the complete opposite it's the more you do the better you feel but i was completely like didn't want to do anything so I got back in touch with the club who I still had a year left on my contract, the year of the operation. I still had a year left on my deal. So the club being good to me like they did, they paid me monthly for the rest. Of, like They let me keep that year and they kept paying me, even though they could have gave me it in a pay up or whatever. They said to me, how do you want it? Do you want us to just keep paying you monthly or do you want it up front? And I said, no, I said, I'd rather it just keep coming in monthly so I know what I have. So I start going back into the training ground and Flinny, Mike Flynn and, and Wayne Hatswell with, with the manager and the assistant. And like, I kept going in every day and they were like, yeah, look, we'll give you a track. So you, you come in as part of the staff now, like you come in on, as they call it, the dark side. Like you come in like, like you don't have to, you don't have to deal with those cunts of players anymore <laughs> and all that. So I'm like laughing about it. But like, it gave me something to actually grow up out of bed for. Yeah. It actually put me on the path to go, look, I've, I've got something to grow up for. Then all of a sudden, like, um, I started saying to the physio, who was Tom Gittles at the time, I started saying to the physio, I was like, look, I said, I want to get fit again because I associated recovering quickly last time at 16 with fitness. And I thought, if I recover from the open heart surgery at 16, because I got fit and because I made myself feel good, this is what's going to be needed this time to make myself feel better. So I'm doing like walks on a track and I'm doing 5K walks. Then I'm doing 5K jog, like jogs and walks. And like I said, I started to build that up and I was like, yeah, I know what, I'm feeling better. But the panic attacks were still happening. Depression was still there. And then I hit just this brick wall. It was one day in training. And I'm sitting down in the canteen. And as I'm sitting there, like in this like little bowl area where like all the tables and chairs and stuff were. And I'm just laying there and uh, I'm texting the doctor. And I can feel my heart rate just going slow. And I'm that focused on it. I thought my heart was ready to stop. And I'm texting him and the minute that realization kicked in that my heart was going to stop, it just started kicking up and the panic kicked in. And I thought, shit, I need to do something. And I'm like grabbing at things. I'm like laying there and the physio come running. He goes, what's wrong? And I goes, I don't know. I said, my heart rate's killing me. I said, I don't know what's wrong. I said, my heart, like I said, I can't. I just couldn't put it into words. And then he came in and he was like, right, do these breathing techniques. He said, lift your legs up, all that. And I just started crying because I didn't want anybody else to see me like this. It was the first time that 
people from what I was describing to people that was happening to me in the train in, in, in my flat that this is the first time anybody could see me and I could see people walking past are you sure you're all right and I didn't want people to see me like that from what I thought was Mark O'Brien the footballer when I was captain at Newport and all the things that I'd done now you're seeing me crying on a, on a bed nervous that my heart's going to stop and like shaking that I'm like close to death like I just couldn't shake it but it was the first time that I was glad they seen it because at the, at that time it was all just words it was all just oh well look at you're just telling me I panic and look at you be grand whereas now they're seeing it for themselves to go actually you know this is actually something serious so then the club doctor got in touch with me who was brilliant through it they're the ones that put me in touch with counselling and I went on to do counselling um, with Sport and Chance from the PFA so I'm sitting there talking and like it was the first time I had to sit there and say do you know what I'm scared or do you know what like I actually am struggling badly and like I actually am really feeling this and I don't know why and I just every time I spoke I just start going into tears and because like I'm talking to somebody who doesn't know me it felt okay to do it but I wasn't able to do it in front of anybody else because what I was in football wasn't that person that was talking about saying do you know what I'm actually like really really struggling and the more I done counselling it allowed me to just accept the fact I've been able to just open up and say that it allowed me like to just kind of be more honest with my ex-teammates and to the manager and different things so I wasn't holding things in or I wasn't trying to like walk away from a situation if I felt a panic coming on or if I felt myself not feeling great that day I actually just openly said it so the counselling was something that I never knew was needed but it was a, like a massive turning point that through all my career I used to see everything in such a positive way and such a highlight and everything was brilliant to then this time I was actually needing someone to show me the way back to positivity because I was just, I was seeing everything negative as I said the counselling brought a lot out in me to then when a panic attack another one happened and they were happening a bit more frequent the more I'd done counselling because I was reliving everything again and then I had a panic attack and then Matty Dolan, who, like I said, he's, he's he's like a brother to me now. Whereas, like you say, in football, you've got friends in football, you've got people that you come across. But this is someone that is like literally him and a, and a couple of other people that have just been like unbelievable for me in, in this situation that I had a panic attack and it must have been one o'clock in the morning. And he's someone that's like got a kid and everything. So you, you have that off chance and hope that he's going to be awake. And I found them like, and I'm shivering a bit because my ma's gone home at this stage because everything was on the up a little bit and I'm like scared to be living on my own. So he came around at one o'clock in the morning and all he did was sit on the side of the bed because I used to, I used to like sleep at night with my door unlocked because when someone would come and collect me or take me to train in the next day, if I wasn't awake or if something went wrong, that was my mentality of going, at least my door's open, they come in and find me. Like that's where my head was that I didn't give myself a fighting chance. Mm. Whereas now, <clears throat> Matty took me around, like he, he came around at one o'clock in the morning, he packed the bag and goes, right, you're staying with me for a week or two. He said, like, you're staying with me and moved me into his house for like two weeks. So I wasn't by myself just to get myself through certain little bits. And like I say, without him doing stuff like that. And he was the first person, like him and his missus and stuff like that, where I'd sit and I just... But I just burst into tears in front of them. I said, I don't know why this is happening to me. I said, you know me as a player. Like justifying, you already know me. Don't judge me now yeah. kind of thing. That was like... Did that define you? Yeah. That I said, like, this isn't me. I said, and I need, and I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. But like the process of coming back from it all is stuff that even I look at now that I had to go through it all to kind of be where I'm at right now. It's like I have much more of a relaxed view and I know it's probably going to sound philosophical, but on life itself, I just, I'm so much more relaxed. Yes, I still struggle with not playing. I still struggle with all them different things, but I look at football now to say, well, at least I'm still alive to watch it. Mm -hmm. And that puts a better spin on it to say, I wish I was still playing. Because I think even if I retired at the age of 35 or 40, I still would have been wishing I'd be playing at the age of 50 and 60. So that mm -hmm. would never leave me. You start realising who are the real friends in your life. You start realising who are the real people in your life that weren't just there for your success. And when I've started to see that, like there's names I can reel off, like Joss Labadee is someone that I lived with. And like he moves, he moved on from the club, but he's still on the phone to me, he's still making sure that I'm okay. Mickey Demetrio is another one. There's Matty Dolan, 
Newport as a club, Michael Flynn, like all of them at that club, as well as the club doctor, they're all people and the physio that all came together for somebody that, yeah, I was a Newport player, but now that I wasn't a Newport player, they were even more than happy to still help me. Like you say, taking me into the Mm -hmm. house and stuff like that. So like I say, this probably taught me the biggest lessons and the best lessons I've ever had in life. But to take that forward now is just something where that's that's why I do what I do now, like going forward, is that I try and help people because I know people what it feels like to be helped. I know what it's like for panic attacks, depression. I know what all of it is. And it's not nice to say I've experienced it, but the fact that I have experienced it, you can actually relate better to people because it's not about saying, and I've said it to numerous people, it's not about saying like, oh, well, I broke my arm and you've broken your finger so mine's worse because it's my arm it's about saying well you're going to feel the same feelings i feel whether it's down and out whether it's depressed or whether it's panics whether mine's open heart surgery or yours is a broken leg we still feel the same thing so we can always relate by the way it's not just physical injuries is it split up with your girlfriend you've got gambling problems yeah exactly drink, and alcoholic it's and that's what i mean and they're all the same feelings yeah. and it's what people differentiate between the two and why they don't speak is to the point of going oh, well, look, I can't say what I've said to you because you've had open heart surgery. Mine's only breaking up with a girlfriend. And you're like, well, no, it's still the same feeling. So talk to me about it because I know what I've been there. And then when they start talking, it's like you you gain another level of a friendship with someone that you never thought you could get. Like I say, with the lads in football or mates back at home or even sometimes my own family or people have known me whole life, they've opened up to me and said, oh, Mark, like I've had panic attacks for the last 10 years. And like, this is something that you never even knew, but people letting you in that little bit more just because I'm being open and honest about something feels so much more rewarding and more of a purpose than like I said football ever did like football I see it as a chapter in my life now whereas now that I've overcome that and now that I've got past that it's like right there's a bigger picture to all this like I've gone through all of this for a reason and I'm going to make that reason to be known to kind of say well if this was for a reason it's not going to just be oh Mark he was the footballer it's going to be well now I've gone through all of this to try and help other people now but we've spoken to loads of lads who've obviously really struggled with just finishing football alone. And you've you've gone through two open heart surgeries as well as the career coming to an end. Did, you know, when you when it comes to dealing with it, did you see all that anxiety from the the scans every 12 months as kind of a build-up of trauma that then you had to understand and deal with? Yeah, like ev- everything was one big build up because what I only thought was the retirement deal with that. What I thought was this, like was the open heart surgery at 27 deal with. I thought I dealt with all of it at 16 because I've went on and played. It's all forgotten about. It's been and gone. But it was when I had to like go back over it all. And as I said, the counselling kind of unraveled all of it. And that's when the tears came. Like when I was talking about when, when I was 16. you've and, been bottled up for so long. Yeah, and like you say, you don't... you you don't understand it. Like you don't think something can be bottled up without even realising it's bottled up. But it was when you have somebody just, like you say, just the last year, a simple question and you just start talking and talking and talking and you realise afterwards to go, I actually didn't even like know I remembered all that or I didn't know that was actually affecting me. But it was in the... It was all in there and, and all of that, like you say, comes to the forefront and the fact that I'm in a position now that has come, like overcome it and... I'm not sitting here now saying that I still don't struggle some days when I go, well, my chest feels a bit weird and I have that anxious feeling or if I do feel a bit like shit on a day that I didn't sleep right, some nights I don't sleep great, but I know how to deal with it a bit better because of the stuff on the protocols that I've went through talking with everybody else. So if I did have a bad night, I'll voice it the next day and just go, look, I feel shit today. Like I had a shit night's sleep and I panicked because of this, but I've learned that once it's off your chest, at least you're letting someone know about it. So if something does go wrong or something does happen, people are aware of it, that you haven't just kept it silent for yourself and let it eat away at you and eat away at you. And like you say, it sounds simple, but it was something that I had to learn myself to do. Like it wasn't something that just came natural to say, I want to talk about it because for so long, like 10, 11 years of football, I had to keep my open heart surgery scans and everything to, like as a secret really for, like people who knew me knew about it if there was big cup games that came around it was in the newspapers and open heart surgery to play against so and so like yeah it's all well and good people knew about it but nobody if anybody ever said oh so how's your heart now my only answer would ever be yeah it's fine 
Like I never would talk about it because I just thought the less spoken about it, the better. Like no one needs to know. But now all of a sudden it's like, well, there's no need to hide behind that anymore. I might as well tell everybody exactly what went on and the life I've had. And if that does help somebody and not just in football, great if in football, but just in life themselves to kind of go, well, if I can have the stuff that have happened or things that have went on in my life that are normal day to day life things for people and still was able to try and have a career and do what I've done anybody can do it because I'm literally just a lad that moved away from Dublin that I've picked up difficulties along the way but the actual drive in me or whatever I wanted just didn't stop me and that's what you try and pass on to other people now to kind of say nothing should ever stop you if it's something that you want to do regardless of the situation if somebody tells you there's still a chance for you to do it and that's what you want to do then it's it's achievable regardless of what it is. Well like when I was thinking about it you know when you you had the 10 years you haven't really dealt with the fact that you could you know every scan that you went for every year you haven't dealt with the fact that it could be over properly have yeah. you because yeah that hit you like a ton of bricks when it did come around yeah so uh, you now would deal with it better you'd, you'd probably think about and go right this this could be it and it wouldn't hit you as hard as it did if you know what i mean but you've had to go through all that to yeah. realize it yeah exactly and like i said I, like I, I said before I think I got greedy with the fact of people saying to me oh no it's fine oh no it's fine and I never it kind of tuned me out of thinking what could go wrong do you think that subconsciously built it up yeah and that would have been because that subconscious of building it up actually kind of fell to me then once it hit me it was like not just hearing that you need open house it was the fact of you're not telling me it's okay anymore. Yeah. Like, actually, I wasn't prepared for this. You've been like, waiting uh, 10 years for yeah, that news. Like, like, it's the news that you've been waiting on, but you never wanted to hear it. And you're working at uh, Newport at the minute? You yeah, no, I am work, I'm, I am working in, fo- uh, in in Newport now. Like, I've I've adopted a, a, a role that has kind of fitted me perfectly through everything. Is is kind of like a player care, which is something where when young lads step into the force team, kind of a little bit of a mentor kind of person, that if they're struggling... If they've got any concern, what's the do's and the don'ts? If any of the force team lads are struggling with things that might have gone on at home or if they need like a point or somebody to speak to, if the manager's laid in on them or a new player comes in, like I'm that kind of say bridge the gap person that kind of helps them. And like you say, all them experiences coming back into for this role to kind of say, do you know what? It actually fits me perfect that to a selfish point, I wish I had that when I was a player. To kind of say when I had me long term, yes, I had like older experienced players, but they were getting back fit themselves. I didn't have somebody to go, look, this is what you need to do. And and, and that kind of self-care, like at certain clubs, like like Luton was probably one of the worst times in my career. And I think Nathan Jones had a big part to play in that. When John still got sacked and he came in from and it sounds like after all these stories, like any club I went to, a manager got sacked, so I was getting everybody <laughs> bleeding sacked. <laughs> But it was like he came in and obviously he, he came in off the back of being at Brighton's under 23s and he had this big kind of ego about him and I'm going to get Luton to the next best thing. I've been brought in to improve this club. And as that season went on, I'm not in the team and I'm making the bench once or twice, but I'm not in the team. I'm sitting in the stands and finished off the season. I still had a year left on my deal, went off into the summer. So I know I still had a year left at Luton, came back into pre-season. You go to see where your squad number is for your kit laying out. There wasn't, my squad number wasn't there. So the kit man comes in and goes, oh, that's your kit for this year. The manager took your squad number. So then I put my kit on. The manager goes, oh, B, just want to talk to you in the office for a bit. So he pulled me in on the first day and just goes, eh, right, we're going to look to get rid of you. You're on the transfer list. I said, why? And he goes, he said, look, we're moving forward in a different direction. Um, it's just business at the end of the day. Look, you're a great lad. It's just business. I said, but I haven't got anywhere to go. He goes, yeah, yeah. He said, look, you you get your agent to work on that. I said, I don't have an agent. He said, you just, he said, well, he said, look, we'll try and give you, we'll try and help you. But in this time, I wasn't allowed to train with the force team. So I was training with the under, I was training with the under 18s. So I'm training with the kids in pre-season, but then the kids flew away to Italy for two weeks. The force team flew away to Austria for a week and I was left in the training ground by myself doing pre-season. So I'm going in every day on my own and I'm running on a treadmill, not knowing what to do really in pre-season and I'm going into a gym every day, every morning turning up and it was it was getting like, like you say, it was that kind of mentality again of like, I'm going to show this fuck like that. You're not going to like get me down yeah. kind of thing. So again, I come back um 
the first team are back in the under 18s are back and then got told I was involved in a friendly in pre-season so I thought this is great might might be a slight opportunity to do something so I turned up to the game and it was all the 18 slash 16s in the change room and all the shorts were out and everything and got sat down got given the captain's armband like I thought this was a piss take I was captain of the under 16s 18s <laughs> going out to play in a pre-season friendly and I was against Colchester's Force team slash 23 is team like in pre-season <laughs> so I went out and as I said like I'm already fuming but you're playing the game like do what I need to do I played like 65 70 minutes got taken off so then like Andy offered there was someone that was like he done well like he, he was good with me like in all fans he was like look he said just be an example to all the young players and stuff like that he said I don't want like he said I know it's frustrating where you're at but he said be an example for the lads like he said show them the right way so I was like right no problem so like as I said like I'm in training with them each day and stuff like that I'm kicking lumps out of them and like kind of like he said preparing them for four times so they're doing set pieces and I'm fucking ragdolling people left right and centre like, <laughs> most of me frustration Can coming out just yeah, yeah. Like, you're, fucking, like, you're bullying them yeah, yeah. basically, that's yeah. what, that's basically, what's basically I was bullying every last one of them but <laughs> But then you have like him sticking up for it going, well, that's where you're going to get in the force team if you just want to step up. And I'm just like <laughs> fucking reefing people and all that. But like you say, the frustration was starting to build because if I'm training with the 16, say Monday to Friday, then not in the squad on a Saturday, then somebody could get injured on a Saturday. Nathan Jones would call me over halfway through training. Right, we're a body down, you're over. I train with the force team. And then once that body comes back, I'm back fucked off with the 16. So I was just like, he's trying his hardest. So then... Do you not have the like when you went over? You not think I'm just gonna fucking start laying people out? Yeah, and, and but that's but that's the thing. Look, I actually went over and trained well, and I'd have Mick Harford who was there, and he'd be coming over and going, "Fucking well done today, you well done," and that'd be the end of it, and then you fucked off back again. So like it was like I looked at it going, no matter how well I do, like what do I actually yeah, need right. to do here? Because I've not given up, I've not done anything wrong, I've not been an arsehole in and around the training base, I've not messed up with any plans like I'm the only player out of all of the John Still players that were here that you've not actually given any minutes to and you've not given me a reason why you've not said anything so it carried on from that the time got on at Luton and it got the deadline day and when I got the deadline day um, all of a sudden my phone rings off I think it was at 2-3 o'clock Nathan Jones so I answered it and he's talking to me and he's like oh B so what your, what's your plans? I said, I haven't got any plans. I said, you've seen me pre-season. I said, most of it I've been on my own. I said, Tranmere I was with for five days. I said, like, there's not been anything. My phone's not, like, ringing off the hook. I said, like, there's nothing. Right, well, we're looking to give you a pay-up. He said, right, we're going to give you seven or eight months of your deal. He said, and we'll pay it up to you. And then he said, you can go and do your own thing. And how long's left? I still had, I still had like, that full season left. So from August till the May, I still had that full season left. So he goes, I'm, like, near enough going to pay me up the whole, like, rest of the year. And I goes, I can't. He goes, what do you mean you can't? I said, well, I've got rent to pay for here. I said, if I go out on trial anywhere, I said, I have to pay for everything myself. I said, nothing's a guarantee. Whereas I said, I'm still guaranteed a year's money. And he goes to me, you've not played for six months. So if you're not played for six months, you're not fancy your chances going out anywhere else because you're not going to play here. I said, it's not about that for me. I said, if I leave here, I said, I mean, the next like plane for me is home to Dublin. I said, I've got nobody ringing me phone. So then he goes, right, we've got a solicitor here till six o'clock. He said, so we need to know your answer by five. And this is like phoning me at like two, uh, like three, four o'clock. So I was like, all right. So I was getting on to Gary Brabham. I was getting on to Dino. I was getting on to people that I just come across that I don't really know. And Brabs was coming back to me and he was just like, look, oh babe, we can't really get you in at the moment. We're waiting on someone to leave for, to be able to get you in. So he said, my hands are tired. So then my phone went at five o'clock and it was Nathan Jones again. And he goes, right, so what's your decision? I goes, I don't have one for you. I said, I don't know what. I said, I, I can't make a decision just now in the space of two hours on the rest of my career. I said, like, as far as, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, I said, I'm still here. I said, I'm not doing anything. And then his tone started to change. Like, he went from this, oh, we'll help you. We'll do whatever we need. And his tone started to change. He was like, well, so, you, so you don't think I'm good enough to go out somewhere and you don't fancy your chances? You're not back yourself. And I goes, no, I do back myself. But I said, you're not giving me the opportunity here. And he said, what, so you're blaming me? It's my fault that you're not that, that you're moving on. I said, well, it has to be. I said, you're the manager. I said, if you chose to play me and I said I played shit, then it's my fault. I said, then I'd done wrong on the chance that you're giving me. I said, you never played me a single minute. I said, and the fact that you've not played me a single minute and you're blaming me for it, I said, that doesn't go down well with me. So we had it back and forth and he goes, right. He said, I've not been the type of manager to do this. But he said, look, 
the solicitor will go at seven o'clock so i'm gonna phone you back in an hour i want the decision so then hang up the phone got back on to cliff wasn't hearing that and back from any other team so then the phone went again at seven on the phone he goes Roy, what's the answer and i goes I'm, i can't leave I said, I've, I said, I can't do it. I said, I've got no family home. I said, you were expecting me to pack all my bags up, carry them all the way around like England with me just to get a club. I said that I don't have a family home where I can drop my bags off and go out and do what I need to do. I said, everything comes with me. He was like, oh, well, if I was in your shoes, he said, I'd do it completely different. He said, this is a new lease of life for you. I said, no, it's not. I said, my next journey is either go home to Dublin because I said, my phone isn't ringing. And I said, plus the transfer window doesn't go with the teams that are actually interested in me. I said, Southport, Tramway, they're all conference teams. So that's not the transfer window. He goes, oh, I can get you in at Yeovil. I said, well, why didn't you tell me that at the beginning of pre-season? <laughs> I said, like, you're telling me you can get me all these places now. And he goes, well, I'm not the type of manager to do, but if I have to, I'll bring you in seven days a week. And I goes, well, you'll be doing me a favour. I said, you'll be keeping me fitness up because I said, I don't do anything in the other two days that I'm off. I said, so you might as well bring me in seven days a week. <laughs> so then all of a sudden I had that bit of back and forward, hangs up the phone, phones me again at nine. So what? So is, is that you staying then? And I goes, yeah. I said, I'm not. He goes, see you Thursday. I just hung the phone up. So then Gary Sweet, the chairman, phoned me up. He goes, OB, what's going on? I said, look at Gary. I said, you sign me here. I said, you know the player that I am. I said, I'm not doing this for money. I said, I'm not doing this for any sort of being awkward. I said, I literally don't have a club to go to. I said, if I had someone to go to and a bit of security, I said, I'd be there in a heartbeat. I said, because I'm not enjoying and I don't like the manager. I said, and obviously he has something against me. I said, but it's nothing to do with you. And I said, that will never be the case. And he goes, right. He said, look, he said, I know that. I, he said, I know. He said, it's unfortunate that things haven't worked out well for you at Luton. And it's really unfortunate that it hasn't. But you know what? He said, we'll do everything in our power to help you. He said, don't worry. He said, leave it with us so I was like right fine so then went into Nathan Jones on the tours they pulled me in he goes oh wait, what are you still doing here <laughs> and I said I said what do you what do you expect I said I was either going to wake up with no contract I said with a full pay up in my bank and not know where to go I said because I had nowhere to go or else I said I still have something to come into every day which is yours I said and it gives me something to work towards he goes well look you know that you're not going to play here so let's just leave it at that and then I got up and walked out and then it was only a couple of weeks later then Southport came in took me out on loan and I went there and played for like about five or six games and I ended up doing something like to like a certain like kind of fibre in my knee or something I don't know what, what it is that I had to go back and do rehab at Luton so it kind of paid out to where like I actually needed Luton for the medical stuff for everything because like I said I would have been out on my arse if, if, if this had been if I was going on trial so when I went back to Luton, I paid up on I paid up on my um, apartment because obviously I was meant to be at Southport for four months all the way till January to then hopefully move on. And um, so I went when I went back to Luton, I was like, look, I've got nowhere to stay. And they were like, that's not our problem. I was like, right. So I ended up having to book myself into a hotel that was like locally, like an, a B&B a &B, and actually lived there for the re, re, like the remaining months of me being at new uh, at Luton, pay for it, all my own money. Like I, I spoke with the manager who was brilliant with me of the B&B &B and like cut me a deal like for, for the rooms and stuff like that. But like there was no support or nothing from Nathan Jones or anything like that to kind of say he knew of my situation, he knew where I was staying, he knew of everything. But just because I was part of it and it was a business thing, like he took the human aspect out of it to something I was used to with Clough who treated you as a human. McLaren, as I said, give me the security of someone who would be honest with me and say, look, we'll move you on here, but we'll do everything we can in our power to help. Like this was just someone that just disregarded me. And because it was a business deal, it was like you forget someone as an actual person. I was really down and out and football was actually beating me up. Mm. And it was twice as hard because, again, the whole heart situation was I'm not playing when I am fit to play, me time like me, my career is already on a scale, and now I'm not playing. So like, literally, what what am I doing with myself? And then, that's when I ended up getting a text. It was around January time. I got a text off Dino you know, to say, "Are you fit?" And that was to come to Newport. So he said, "Yeah, I'm fit." I said, "I just haven't played." I said, "I haven't played a single minute for twelve months now, from the last January to this one." And he goes, "Right, well, we want to take you in." He said, "Because we're we're in the shit." So I was like, "Right, fine." And he goes, right, you have to meet uh, Graham Wesley, he said, in a hotel in London. So then when I told uh, Alan Sheen, Alan Sheen goes, right, do you know Wesley? And I goes, no. 
he goes, right, he said, if this fella asks you, do you want to be the best player in League 2? He said, you have to tell him you want to be the best player in the world. He said, he just wants you to be fucking positive and he wants you to have ambition to be fucking the best. He said, if you tell him I want to be the best in League 2, he'll say, why not League 1? He said, he'll always that kind of mentality. So I was like, right. So I went to this hotel not knowing what I was getting myself into. And he walked in and a pair of flip-flops in his Newport tracksuit at the time. And he walked in and I stood up to shake his hand and he kind of like, shook me hand but he's like he looked me up and down as he shook me hand and he goes right when we sit down here what you want and I goes I'll have a cup of tea and he goes right he goes so tell me about yourself so I goes like just giving him anything I could go no I'm a defender like I heart on <coughs> like heart on my sleeve like give you 100% all them kind of things so like, right. he said yeah because he said look I don't know anything about you he said don't know nothing about you he said I'm just going off the back of Dino because you worked there on my Southport Dino he said speaks highly of you he said, and I trust in Dino's opinion. He said, and just a little bit of a background on myself, he said, like, obviously I'm a manager at Newport, like, had great success with, with Stevenage, and, like, I'm a kind of Jose Mourinho slash Alex Ferguson type manager. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, swear to God. And and as he said that to me, I'm just sitting there thinking, right, and he goes, and I'm going to give, like, I'll, I'll push you to your max. He said, I'll try and get the best out of you. He said, if you just do well by me, he said, look, I'll leave you to your own devices, blah, blah. He goes, right, so we play Stephen is away on Saturday. Do you want to play? And I goes, yeah. I goes, right. He said, what's your situation at Luton? And I said, well, I said, I'm still waiting on a pay up. But um, I said, like, I can sort all that now and now and I can come to Newport. And he goes, don't have to do that just yet. He goes, right, we'll phone your chairman now. Put the phone in the middle of the table and press call. Put it on loudspeaker. So I'm sitting there and the phone's ringing. And then Gary Sweet does an answer. So then... Graham Wesley puts it to the side and he was just talking to me a little bit about what was happening at Newport and what he's planning on doing, bringing loads of numbers in and all these different things. And then he goes, that's actually pissed me off. That has right, I'm going to try it again. And then Gary Sweet answered. So I'm sitting there and he goes, Gary, he said, I've got one of your players here with me, Mark O'Brien. He said, we're looking to play him on uh, We're looking to play him on Saturday. And this is like on the Wednesday now. What's, what's going on with his contract? And uh, he said, he's looking for a pay up. So Gary goes, right, put him on the phone. So Gary straight on the phone to me and was just like, right, Mark. He said, we'll we can give you a month's pay up. And I still had seven months left to me. He goes, give you a month. He goes, Gary, surely it's going to be better than that. I said, look at I said, he goes, well, he said, look at it this way. He said, you've either got a manager there that wants to play it this Saturday or you come back to Luton and don't play for seven months. He said, your choice. So just because he made that one phone call, I literally got shafted. So I just turned around to him and I goes, are you sure there's nothing that can be better? So Graham Wesley heard it and he goes, Gary, surely you can give him X amount. And he was like, no. He goes, right, we'll do it this way. So Graham Wesley put the put the phone down and goes to me, right. He said, we'll take up Luton's contract from January now until May, the last game of the season. And he said, in that deal, he said, we'll pay you what Luton are paying you. But he said, if we get relegated... He said, there's no contract here for you and you don't get your off-season pay. Or if you stay up, he said, you get your off-season pay and there's a two-year deal for you. And just put his hand out like that. And I just sat there thinking, fuck. So I just put my hand out straight away and I shook it <laughs> because I thought I have nothing else to go for. Like, I just thought, like, I'm, like if I say no, I go back to Luton and not play. Or he's literally putting it to me now to say, okay, here's a little incentive for you. And he loves incentives. He's someone yeah. who's like, Roy, what's your incentive? So like he put his hand out and I thought if I don't shake his hand here, like the deal's done. So I just put it out, shook his hand. He goes, right, I'll see you Friday. And then that was it. I went back to Luton, packed up my bags, travelled down Thursday night, Friday, and then played on the Saturday. Bear in mind them were, bot- were the bottom of the league then? Yeah, they were like the rock drift. bottom. Like I didn't, I didn't know the whole circumstance of everything of the points, like difference and stuff like that. I just knew they were bottom of the league and he said, look, uh, I'm bringing in all fresh bodies to try and like bring something back. So I hadn't really understood what was going on, but I just seen it as right, he wants me to play. So this is great. And you just gone? I'd left in the November, yeah. I'd seen the sinking ship. <laughs> <laughs> you jump ship. Yeah, jump jump ship. <laughs> Land ahoy. Get me off this <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, and then, like I say, I ended up going to, I ended up getting in. And then the first game, like we had like a completely new back four. We had like two new strikers and all that. Like, so we changed the whole thing around. Like he just brought in all this like new players. But like when I went in on my first day, the first session was on the Friday was over on the Astro Turf. Like the, it's like, it's like training on a car park. Like it's that hard. 
but we were just doing 1v1s all day. So he was bringing us all in as fresh and it was like 1v1, 1v1, then we were doing 2v2s and all that back four work. But I'm hearing all the lads like talking and getting involved with each other and I thought, oh, right, I'm the only new one here. I didn't realise the right back, me, the other centre back and the other left back, we were all like brand new. So like we were all looking at each other going, how the fuck do all of us even play? He was just like, yep, this is what we go with. He goes, I've made nine changes in it to a squad before for a match day and it's come out perfect and I think I've got the same group here and all that. And then at the end of training, like, so we'd done that for about an hour and a half, 1v1s and all that, so your legs are hanging. So I think that's a normal training session, but for a Friday, it was a bit like fucking much. But then he goes, right, one team down there, two teams up here, box the boxes. So we fucking ran and ran and ran. And then as I'm walking off, like my legs are fucking heavy, knee feels like it's a balloon. And all the other lads walking off who have been there with them since like the like since the start of the season, like fucking hell, that was that was all right today, that. And I was like, fucking, that's all right for a Friday. <laughs> Can I you see like, why I wanted to get out? And I was like, surely that that's that's not it. Like went down, played the game against Steven as we lost three 0 Like it didn't go well, but like he he, he kind of took it as like look at I'm rebuilding and stuff like that, but. As the sessions went on, like there was no day that was easy. He used to look at it and say, look, if you can run 10K in training, 10K in a game would be a breeze. And I used to think like, but it's time I get to a game, I won't be able to fucking reach fucking 10K because my legs would be hanging. And we used to do gym sessions, but he used to call it brain training. So like you're going in there and you lift up a five kilo weight and he's like, right, 50 reps on your right arm. And like you go around each individual. So I would be, let's say, start 50 reps right arm. So I'd count out one, two, next fella, right, 50 reps left arm, and you have to just do it all. And then it's like 50 reps with a squat, 50 sit-ups, 50 press-ups. Have you got the dumbbells? Yeah, so like there's five kilos in everybody's hand, whether right. it's a dumbbell or whether it's like a five kilo plate you had to make do. Put the plate above your head, so on your arms are bollocks, the plate's above your head, and you're walking around. And as it's dropping like that, he's, run, he's walking around, he's punching people in the stomach, saying, fucking keep holding it. <laughs> and you're thinking, what is going on here? And like, like there's people we do more circuits like as that's going on but he used to say well if you're going to quit here you'll quit on a fucking Saturday so like you kind of knew his whole mentality was that was like kind of like pure motivation pure like do it together and 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 it was even when we were doing the indoor and the astro like Darren Jones who was there at the time yeah we were all sitting in having breakfast and Dan Butler was there as well and like we're all sitting there going fucking hell me back me knees and everything but Wesley doesn't want to hear it if anything so he wants to hear that you're feeling fresh as a daisy so as he walked in he goes morning Jonah he goes morning Gaff he goes how are you feeling today and he goes oh back's a bit stiff and he said like just feeling a bit tired not living right are you not living right and he goes well it's the indoor that we've done for an hour and a half and he said the astro tour and stuff like that he said like it's kind of like catching up on me a bit and like we're all sitting there as a group just before he walked in saying I feel fucking stiff Dan Butler's thinking like he's meant to be really into fitness he's like my back is killing me so Darren Jones is just like being the the brave one to kind of say it so then Wesley just goes mustn't be living right Jonah because what about you but you're always fit as a fiddle how do you feel fucking great gap honestly I feel fucking amazing right? <laughs> And we literally burst out laughing. So we Wesley walked down and Darren Jones goes, you fucking shit. <laughs> and we just burst out laughing. <laughs> and he, and because Butts wasn't playing, he goes, well, fucking hell, I want to fucking play at least. <laughs> but it was one of them where like, you had to you had to tell him what he wanted to hear because there was even a training session with Paul Big Night. He was coming back off injury. He had a serious injury and we'd done this thing, murder ball, where it's like the width of the six yard box. There's a big goal on the edge of the 18, a big goal on the end line with the six yard box and he throw a ball in and it's like basically pass it with your hand but you had to volley it to score. But the only way to block you had to dive in front of it. So Paul Bignot, it was his fourth session back on a Friday, he was diving around everywhere and he's yeah, yeah, give me the ball, fucking. And he goes, I'm fucking having that. We are playing Mansfield the next night. He goes, I'm fucking having that. So he's back after probably about four or five months of an injury or something he was out with. So Wesley put him back into the starting 11 just for that one session of mortar ball diving around after. <laughs> but... Like you say, it was something where if you tell Wesley what he wants to hear, he'll fucking play your hands down. Like there was a dart board even in the training ground and one of the lads was coming back off a knee injury and he had three darts in his hand and Graham Wesley turned around to him and he goes, right, if you hit the bullseye, I'll start tomorrow. He goes, serious? He goes, yeah. So fucking hit the bullseye for start. And he goes, right, starting centre half and started him. And he was coming back off a knee injury that he was out with for about five months. Just stuff like that was just mental. So like, you, I, 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 thought I couldn't understand that. You it. know, when I've told you you're a psychopath, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're starting to get a little bit of an insight now. What a fucking oh, like you. <laughs> oh, I like you. Did you, enjoy, did you enjoy playing? 
for him. Do you know what? Like with me, he was all right. You're good at darts, though, aren't you? Yeah. Like with me, with me, he was all right. Like <laughs> I was unbelievable. I hit the ball every time. <laughs> no, but with me, he was actually all right. Like he just kind of brought me in to say, look at this, what I'm bringing you in for. Take everything how you do. Like I will push it, but if you just do your own business, he said, and like I, I won't go match it and stuff like that. So he never really had anything to say to me or bad about me and stuff like that. And that's why I was like, right. But I've seen how he's been with other players. But with me, he was he was spot Did on he honor that contract then? Well, it's written in your contract if you if you stay up, you get your two years. No, it was it, in all fairness, it was it was more of a handshake. So when he left, I hadn't got a clue what, what was going to happen. I mean. So when it, when he kind of left, I think he made he made like Flinny aware of it. Like I think everybody in the club knew they were aware of it, but nothing was written up. Nothing was like kind of like this is what's going to happen. When he left, as I said, we were playing late in Orient. Everything was like meant to be wonderful and we're doing like this team building thing and obviously like Craig Reid is someone that was just the way you're seeing him he was a Wesley boy he was someone where Wesley would bring him everywhere and knows exactly what he's like and we'll we'll do well by him and stuff like that and we all had a team meeting and he said write down your best 11 so we're all writing down our best 11s and stuff like that and again no one put Craig Reid into that team so Wesley pulled him on the day before the game and dropped him there and then and goes look at None of your teammates trust you, so I can't I can't have you in the team because none of them trust you. So then we went out and played the game and we played late in Orient at home. And I think they were they were relegated at the time and they just played a bunch of kids. And the bunch of kids that they played, um literally I think within the first twenty minutes we were three 0 down. <laughs> oh like God. literally we came in at half time and the manager's like, You're getting beaten up by a bunch of fucking kids and everybody's laying into you and we're just thinking I've got nothing left in my legs. Like literally, I'm, I fell down and out. And this was like the kind of like this was the game that either if we stay, if we won that game, Wesley would have stayed on and probably it wouldn't have finished how it did. But because we lost four 0 to a team that's already relegated, the, the club had to do something and they sacked them. But how I long think was left of the season? This was March time, so there was about. I think they had a point reduction. I think in the late in Orient. Yeah, that's why they were down. Yeah. So this was around March time and. Again, it was that kind of thing. It was a change of manager. I was thinking, fuck, because every time I've had a change of manager, it's always gone wrong for me. But Flinney was already part of the coaching staff. So at the time he came in, he brought in Wayne Hatswell with him. When they took over, it was 11 points with 12 games to go. And then we got it back to about four or five with about three or four to go. And then we, we played Exeter away. But this day was was the maddest day. It was a typical, I call it nowadays, a Newport day. So we're traveling down on the day, like so warm. Traffic from fucking here all the way to Exeter by the looks of it. We're stuck in traffic. So all of a sudden it's like panic stations. Are we going to get there on time? Is this game going to get called off? Like there's no waters on the bus, there's nothing. So we're all sitting there and we're thinking, Jesus. So Flinny's running up and down the bus. Who's big on socials? Who's big on socials? Say like we're dehydrated on the bus. Get the game off because we can't go down and be late for the game. Say the game's off. And then just like fucking Moses in the Red Sea, the traffic like just looked like it just went like that and just fucking separated and we just carried on to the game so we the game got put back to quarter to four so by the time we kicked off so we got there at about 20 20 to 25 to four got our shorts on got changed went out on a jog across the pitch a little bit of a possession straight in changed out to play by half time we knew Hartley Pill has lost so it was kind of like right lads we need a fucking big point today we need a win we ended up winning the game one nil against all odds turning up late for the game hardly a warm up we win one nil so winning that game one nil, I think put us within arm's length of of Hartlepool, which then I think put us within a point behind them or something like that after that game, which then we had a couple of I think we had two or three games after that where we caught them. So we were a point ahead, or we were two points ahead, or was something like that with um with the last day of the season, which everybody kind of knew we were kind of like look, it's always going to come down to the last day. It's always going to be that drama day. So that whole week, like you're having everybody from the media who obviously said Newport are down or out now, you have Sky Sports and everybody getting involved going, Newport can pull off the greatest thing that they've ever done from March at being this point. So the like expectation and the kind of pressure of the game kind of went straight through the roof. And Rodney Parade at that time was getting, I'd say, at most 1,100 fans in. Like there was hardly anyone turning up to the game. And we found out that the game was a sellout, 7,500. 
it's it was like one of those games you wake up that morning and it was a 20 past five kickoff but like i'm awake at like fucking eight o'clock half seven thinking this can't be happening like literally like the nerves are running through you like bigger because it feels like it's an actual cup final not just a league game like we've, like what we've done is actually like a massive thing were you thinking more of the fact that you could go down or more of the fact we could have fucking do it it was a bit about I think it was more of the fact of going all the hard work we've put in now for that six months or five months or whatever it was to then if we don't do it it's going to be heartbreaking and then on a personal note I don't have a contract I don't get paid in the off season and I'm fucked like it, like there was everything riding on one game like basically it was like an all or nothing game really so got to the stadium and we're all sitting there and like you say you get the big speech of like this is the be all and end all like this is all or nothing now like go out and make history kind of thing for the club again the game was just scrappy back and forth back and forth we got a pen we went one nil up so we're thinking great one nil up like once once we better our match Hartley Pill score we're safe because we're a point ahead so we find out Hartley Pill are 1-0 down at half time and we're 1-0 up so we're thinking this is fucking brilliant so go back out do exam again once we don't concede we win this game like we're safe so then it was kind of like one of those devil, devil advocate thing is that the ball got played through to the centre half Mickey went to clear it it hits off my shin goes around the other centre back he runs through like I've just played the perfect fucking through ball and he slots it in bottom corner and I'm sitting there and I'm kind of just thinking, fuck. So it's one all, but we still know the Hartley Pool are losing one nil. So everybody was kind of like, okay with it. Then out of nowhere, like there's like 10 minutes to go. And we're hearing the fans like, fucking get it, get the ball, get it back and play, get it forward, get it forward. Flinney makes a substitution, brings on three strikers. So we're looking thinking, what the fuck's going on? So we just found out the Hartley Pool have scored two goals. <laughs> like in like within five minutes of each other, that two one up. We're looking at it going, it can't fucking end like this. Like, we're drawing the game. They're winning. They're obviously going to go. They're, they're staying up. We're relegated. How long's left? There was 10 minutes left in the game. So, again, we're trying everything and there's people shooting from mad distances and all that. So, it, it, it got to about five minutes left and Flinney did it against Carl Oil. He put me up front just to win a flick on or just to do something as a centre-back, just to disrupt something, flick it on, strike it runs in, hopefully score. <clears throat> so, I, I shouted over, Flinney, let us go up top. Flynn was like, no. So Hass just goes, fuck off, get up. <laughs> it don't sound to me as though uh, they, they were right much in tandem. <laughs> these no, no, not at the, to- at the time, no. But it was like, Hatswell just goes, fucking go, go up. So I just remember like the ball got played. So Pipey like went down on his right, cut back and on his left foot, crossed it in. And as he crossed it in, it flicked off Marlon Jackson. And I'm standing behind him. And as it's up in the air, I just chested it and volleyed it into the far corner. And I just turned off and ran and like this is my first ever like league goal, professional goal and ran off like celebrating like mad, like falling, tumbling, like it's the maddest celebration I've ever done. And then literally like the fans are on the pitch, like there's flares going off everywhere and all like that. Out of nowhere, you just see Flinney doing a formation of like, look, fucking 10 at the back, fucking one up top. Or <laughs> like it was, everybody fill a gap at the back. And that's Wells like, no, we'll play a <laughs> nine <laughs> too. <laughs> That's literally. Fuck <laughs> but then we seen the fourth official board go up, like because of the celebrations with that mad. There was six. There was five minutes added on. Literally, like the last video, and I'll always remember the picture. Even standing there, there was like literally nine of us across the back line. There was me, the other centre back, right back there, striker there, another striker there, <laughs> and like it literally, we're literally just standing there, like as in to say, right when you kick, there's one of us are coming running for it, and then the referee blew the whistle, and everybody just fucking fell. <laughs> like literally fell to our backs and as in to say like what has just gone on and like I remember like two of the lads like jumped on on top of me and I'm standing in you see all the fans feet around and stuff like that and it was the first time that I actually start feeling like emotional for football like it was like an emotional drain where I actually felt like proud of something but like it was like from what from the January to then to do what we've done and to know what we've actually done I don't think I understood it as much but like even on a personal note to score that goal to secure myself a contract to kind of turn the life around that I had at Luton 12 months previous to then that like it, it just felt like something that do you know what fucking this this deserved to happen like I deserved some sort of look along the way and that was like kind of the turning point for that at Newport and then like I say for that goal to go in and to to kind of do the stuff that has happened at Newport, it was it was unbelievable. Like, <laughs> <What>? <laughs> must be a film, not a book. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
<laughs> still living there now then aren't you seven years you've been there yeah like I'm seven years there now and as I said like I, I just I, I enjoy it now like I, I enjoy the fact of like being somewhere where you feel as though like you want it and being part of something where you've actually like made some sort of history there with them and I'm glad of everything now when I look back I'm glad of everything I do now because it's put me in that right frame to be able to succeed and do other things um, when's the book out uh, the book is out in September so I'm hoping like it's all done and dusted now it's literally just like the final kind of what's nitty gritty stuff what's it called a uh, game of two hearts so excellent it's, yeah. like it <laughs> like it so it, it kind of it kind of like feeds in well to everything that's kind of gone yeah. on so it's it's as I said like I'm excited to have it out like it's going to be something good that once it's out there and, and people can kind of read it for themselves you can make your own mind up on things or whatever but it's kind of something where I can even look at to go it's an achievement just for myself to kind of go look I've gone even and done a book because it's something that I never thought like my first opinion of it was nobody's going to want to read that nobody wants to fucking hear about my life like I've done nothing in my career when I was being hard on myself like I didn't I haven't done anything but the fact of putting it all in together you kind of go well maybe it's not about what I have achieved it's just going maybe you could help somebody else that they might want to achieve something bigger than what I ever could or go on and help them on their day-to-day life just by reading somebody because I, I only ever see myself as an Irish kid that has just moved away to try and live and play football and I've just dealt with things and everybody has a, has a way inside them to find that reason why to kind of break out of it and when you do find your purpose or whatever anybody can turn it around because I know from myself is that I was that far down and out I know from experience to say anybody can do it because trust me in the mind frame and mindset I was in there's no chance I, I, I would have I should have I've ever turned it around but I actually have and I want to be that example to somebody else that might feel that exact same way or even even half of that to try and just kick kick start them to something just to be that example gives me another purpose in life other than football now. Brilliant. 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 Thank you very much. Cheers. Good Thanks luck with it all now. I need a piss. You got up before us. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Cheers. Thank you very much. Mark O'Brien, what a story. Emotional, wasn't it? Yeah, mm. yeah. I think we should mention it, it was a long recording. We I think we did. Four and a half hours, Four maybe? and a half. Yeah, I think we were a bit fatigued come the end. And hot. Yes, it was very, very hot. Second recording at day, weren't it? Yeah, it was. It'd been a long old day. We drove down to Bristol, didn't we? Yeah. Um, so I think we teed... It was a teeter out at the end. So we, didn't, we didn't sum, summarise as much as I think we'd, we'd like to during the episode. This has us being critical of his own performance. Yeah. yeah. You've got to do that yeah. from time to time, aren't you? you sometimes you've got to take a long, hard look in the mirror. Yep, certainly have. But um, some story, man. Unbelievable. Like just everything, not just the, obviously what he went through with the, with the heart surgeries, but the what happened in the playoffs. Oh, the age it started. Is, is, yeah. Uh, the fact that they said he'll never play football again. And mm. What are you doing if a doctor says that to you? That you probably should not run the head? Oh, I, don't know. You, I don't think you can... I don't think you can say unless you're in that position. Mm. I think it's one of them hypothetical questions that you really can't answer. But I saw something that was on Mark's Instagram recently and there's a lad and... It's a random thing, but they used to play at, I think it was Newport, a lad called Fraser Franks. They had a, a very similar operation. And Mark White, uh, Mark White, Mark O'Brien's been unbelievable with him and his family. Yeah. Like kept in touch with his mum, mum and dad during the night, kept in touch with Fraser during the night, just like helping them through well, it. You can see it's a, a proper nice bloke. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? I can't really believe this, but apparently he was a fucking nasty bastard, mm. you know? I was speaking to Simon field. Ramsden. You know, on the yeah. pitch, that's it. Ramsden told us, didn't he? Yeah. On the pitch, he was a nasty bastard. He was a good yeah. player. But you can't you can't see it when you're from the interview, you think, no, oh, yeah. Like, he, he wouldn't think he'd have it in him, but... Yeah. It's that build-up for me. You know, every year having the, the scan, and just every year, like you, you, you're never fully relaxing, I, I can imagine... All day from day to day, yeah, because yeah. just always in us, the back of your head. The season finishes, and we're like, Oh, thank fuck for that, and put our feet up six weeks and then get back to it. But 
season finishes for him and he's like, is this she, me? Is that, that it? Last one? That last is it one? me done? Yeah. I think it's good now that like lots of players seem to be coming out and talking about it as they're playing as well. You know, Deli Ali spoke out recently. Uh, Rich, Rich, Rich Hartson's, uh, he's said he's coming back and speaking. Rich Hartson? Yeah. Has he? Uh, he said, <laughs> I didn't know what his player meant then, did you? Rich Hardson. Rich Hardson. Rich Hardson. I'm like, oh, I thought you did that on purpose because that's what you used to call him. <laughs> <laughs> I was half in between. Um, but he's co he's coming back from international duty and said he needs to speak to somebody. Has he? Yeah. Um, so it's good that, that by players and just people in general talking about it afterwards is encouraging people to say do you know what i'm not afraid to say that i need to speak to somebody now well hopefully the mentality in football's changing where it's it's not like off oh, we can get them yeah. out of the way i don't need that asshole and men in general yeah i think uh, with that though do you think it's all right people coming out and saying oh it's a great thing and that's what the media is still hammering these lads though at what point do you think it's going to it's going to have a negative effect on the mm. me mental health. I'm going to use Harry Maguire as an example. Yeah. Is it, people are just on his case constantly. But they're not asked, are they? People on Twitter and clickbait and all that sort of stuff, these stories, people are not asked. Makes, but then they're the first ones. Money, they'll, they'll run that story and say, this is unbelievable that he's coming out and speaking out about his problems. And then the, in the same breath, they'll be making Harry Maguire a meme. Yeah. So it's, I don't know, it's always story. that negative spin, isn't it? That they put on things that, that seems to sell more than any. I saw this is something completely different, but I saw. Remember Mighty Ducks, the the film mm -hmm. and the the goalkeeper in it. He, the actor now, he's a drug addict, and he's like down and out, living on the streets, and all the the attention that were put on. Oh, look at. What, what I can't remember his name now. Look at him now, then and now, and now he's fully recovered. And then there's the that massive positive story there that he he was down and out, drug addict, and there was all the clickbait articles about about him being down and out. And look at the state of him now. But now he's come through the other side and he's back back on his feet again. Where are all the, where are all the stories showing the posit positivity? Yeah. And look, he's come through the other side and he's and he's sorted his life out. That's why there's still a long, long way to go with it. But it's what sells, isn't it? Very serious, isn't it? <laughs> Anything like that we would want to take us out with, John? I, I, I don't. <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's got any, uh, um, Blue any advice in, uh, for uh, erectile dysfunction, please get in touch. <laughs> <laughs> I've just noticed your cap flattens your lugs, doesn't it, when you wear it? If, if I it... pull it down too far... I have yeah. to be careful, but it slips. And then I sometimes I end up with elf ears. Well, at the FA Cup. Yeah. <laughs> shall we, uh, <laughs> have we got we any in? What about so again, Mark, Mark White again? Just... You just said, are we doing outro? You've, you, are we getting back in? <laughs> He's still not you got used to it, has he? The Mark White. Oh, yeah, we've got a Mark White. Well, he's sending off. Yes. Great episode. Great think... strike. Unbelievable strike. I can't he's... believe he's a sending off. No, that's a, a joke. So, I mean, we put the video on Twitter. I think we'll put it on Facebook and Instagram as well. But the it was a game after last a week's game episode. Two after. Yeah, uh, he'd already he'd done York City, had he, and maybe had another game post his eight week ban, and his balls come over. And he's give it the avit, and he's give it an oof. No, it was his first. Was that his first game back? No, I don't, I th no, he I said he's had two. Mm -hmm. He's had two where he's got got through unscathed. <laughs> Referee straight over red card, which I thought was harsh. <laughs> Unbelievably like you said, harsh. It was there to be hit. <laughs> it wasn't there to be hit <laughs> with the wrong foot. But as, as soon as he's done it, I mean, it's the cameras on him from behind, so you can't see his face, but you can just see the his shoulders go down, don't they? Here we go again, you know, and he's waiting for it. I've fucking Hands done it again. Hits. I've done it again. But a, it's not a red, surely. It's never been. A, you know, busy people on Twitter saying, oh, it's the laws of the game. I thought the laws of the game were a yellow one, the kicking ball away. No, nah, someone went, someone dug it out and said that, I think managers, if they get caught, you know, when sometimes managers holds it and then puts it round and chucks it away, I think that's a red. Right. But oh, well, even so. By the laws of the game, then, it's a, it, it's a fucking double red. It's a stupid it, law. Then, kicked it that it's far a, away. That's the biggest thing. It's a stupid law. Yeah. 
The laws are ridiculous, aren't they? Like, you, you, like he said in his you're podcast. You're squeezing personality out of the game. Like he said in his podcast. Yeah. But I asked him if he's going to, if they're going to come down on him. He went, I think I'll get away with this one. So I'm guessing it might just be a three game ban where he's got to sit in the, in the stand. Yeah. Rather than out the stadium. <laughs> I wonder if the lads just look around at each other. He's fucking done it again. He's done it again. <laughs> but in, in terms of national, I'm a, Dor I'm a Dorking fan now. Same. I look, I, look, I, look, I look out of the results yeah. 100%. It'd be brilliant if they got promoted. Or got close. I'd love to go. Well, we should go a game anyway. Yeah. But I'm definitely keeping my eye out for the results. <clears throat> if we go to one soon, we'll probably be able to sit with him. <laughs> 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 oh but thanks for watching yeah, thank and you if you've not watching. subscribed on YouTube please do because we're so close to that 100,000 we're getting closer aren't we boss? Um, and if you're not aware of the, the Patreon which some people surprisingly aren't there's two extra episodes every month and a massive back catalogue of yeah it's like four quid a month and three four pound a month and you get the two extra episodes and yeah 100 plus bonus episodes they're already on there and it helps us do the <coughs> normal podcast, the podcast. Mm. yeah so yeah has my cap comment got in your head by the way <laughs> you don't have to take <laughs> it off Sorry. that's better <laughs> <laughs>